they come into turn 11. And the field now being led by Denny Hamlin. He won the poll yesterday. And now he has the honor and is making history as NASCAR is racing in the streets of Chicago. Down the front stretch, they come for the first time. Here they come off the end of the front straightaway. Tyler Reddick in the 45, wasting no time. He's going to jump to the outside of Denny Hamlin. Hamlin slips off the corner. That'll give Tyler Reddick the advantage. Hamlin in the 11, Reddick in the 45. Surprisingly, side by side for the lead through one, through two, and up through Lakeshore Drive, headed to turn three. Denny Hamlin not giving up the position, battles back on the outside of Reddick. The problem is he won't be in position for turn four. Very narrow. Will they sort it out? Threading a needle. Hamlin carrying a lot of speed. They somehow go through there too wide successfully. Now it's off from turn five, back down Columbus as you see the field continuing to file through nice and clean. Really quite shocking, Bags. It is, and I'm surprised that Tyler Reddick was so aggressive on the initial start, but that aggressiveness has paid off. Here they come into the braking zone. They're going all the way down to first gear. Change for third. You see Christopher Bell in the 20. He'll slide off the corner for a while, and that will open the line for Shane Van Ginsenberg. And right now in seven. Yeah, we see Eric Almaroli. He's turned around, coming out of turn number five. We'll see if he can get it going the right direction here. Oh, and we're winding him up here in six. You got Eric Jones involved, Brad Keselowski, He's involved. Noah Gregson's into the tire pack. Gregson's going to back it up. But Eric Jones and Brad Keselowski are wedged together now in six. Here's Brad. He'll back it up. Wait for Eric Jones to do the same. And as they came to grief in six, now they will part peaceably and resume their driving activities. Take another look at what happened here. That's Eric Almarola coming out of five. A lot of bumps there. And that concrete, we've heard SVJ G say that they could be a little slicker on that surface. And Eric Almarola learned it. Here's the pile up in turn six. Yeah, it really starts with the 42 of Noah, uh, excuse me, Eric Jones in the 43. Just in way too deep. Nowhere for the six to go, nowhere for the 42, which is the teammate to that black 43 car in the bottom of the screen. Luckily, the yellow car kind of snuck through behind them there. And another into, oh, Denny Hamlin, the pole sitter. Contact with the barrier. Denny Hamlin, that is turn two, right as you get ready to come down Lakeshore Drive. And Denny Hamlin got a little bit too hot into two. This is a great view right off the front bumper of Hamlin's car. You see the different surfaces. Looking back at the driver himself, he's going to be frustrated. He knows he had track position, obviously some sort of mistake or issue. Listen to Wow, listen to the wheel spin, just how low of grip there is. All right, let's take another look right here. We're going to see all by himself that purple 11 just gets in the corner, loses grip, and slides into the tire barrier. I don't believe there's any damage. That tire barrier did a really nice job. Let's listen. Yeah, I mean, you heard it. No real wheel hop, no real brake input, just too much traction or too much speed for the traction available. So Denny Hamlin, after starting on pole, has fallen back quite a bit. He is down into the 12th position. Tyler Reddick seems to be, well, it's a bad cliche, but on a Sunday drive here in Chicago, out in front of this field, and he's put a second and a half between him second, himself and second place Bell. Bell comes in second spot off the end of the front straightaway under somewhat of a challenge by Shane Van Gisbergen. Right now, they are racing for the second spot with Denny Hamlin finding that calamity in turn two. That's allowed Tyler Reddick to check out. And he's been very brave in these braking zones while he continues to move away. What a battle for second right now. This is the right-hander turn two. They're on Lakeshore Drive and they're racing their way to turn three. You see the comfort right here of SVG. He was able to close in the middle of the corner. Now he gives a little gap on the high speed section, almost breathing the throttle a little bit in turn three. We never saw that in the dry. This is turn four. I love to listen in and just, just how gingerly these guys have to drive these cars. They're very gingerly coming off of five. 
and then they'll let her rip down this straightaway known as Columbus Drive, and then they got to hop hard on the binders coming into turn six. Here they come now, cutting the corner, and that's the onboard shot right now from your third place driver. And as you see, second place is starting to tiptoe away, Jeff. This to me is a very difficult spot under these conditions. Turn Downhill. turn six, Kyle Busch hard into the tire barrier. Oh, he tried to slow down and he just impales that Chevrolet into the tire barrier. Hard contact for Kyle. He's trying to back the car up to get out of the tire pack, but he has wedged that Chevrolet Camaro underneath of the tire pack. And that's the first time we have seen that all weekend long. Windshield deep into the tires there in turn six, and that brings out a full course caution. We have seen on different corners where one car might have an issue, but they know that they can continue rolling. We'll see the blue flag, which is a local caution, but this is a full flag caution now. Kim. And Kyle Busch feels like his car will still roll and he can still race. He did ask for a little help. Take a listen. Well, on the, on the radio, he told him, I just need help getting out of the tire barrier. After that, I should be good. Kyle Busch, you see him just sliding. He was very nervous about the wet conditions and that nervousness proving itself as he gets into the tire barrier. It's just a, a misjudgment of the grip. Much like Danny Hamlin at turn two, Kyle Busch, you saw his speed versus the other cars. Um, and once the car starts sliding, once traction is broken, you're kind of done. It's not going to basically come back to him. I mean, look at the speed. Luckily for Chris Buescher in that 17, that white and blue car, he was far enough in front of Kyle Busch that he didn't get hit. But to your point, Rick, very interesting. So what they're going to do here is literally just tow this car back, Jeff, try to get it out from underneath the tire barrier. Yeah, that's right. They have these hooks put onto the rear bumper. They can hook it up, pull it out. Kyle Busch says he thinks he's okay to roll. I think one thing that's important to remember is that Setups matter. How you set your car up for this race does make a difference. Most teams probably were set up for the drive based on practice yesterday. Your car may not break as well as someone else's. It may not turn as well as another competitor. You're going to have to drive your car to its limit and not get pulled into chasing speed at this moment. Understand where you have grip and where you don't. Ignore the people around you. That's very difficult to do for a race car driver. But in these conditions, that is what is required. I want to see if this car can let's well, see how what this it looks really like. works. Yeah, what let's it looks what like. It, yeah. Man, just like that. <laughs> Listen to the crowd, by the way. Look at the crowd. Yeah. 20 deep over there in turn six. Kyle Busch had it fired up. They backed him out. We'll see if he's able to continue on. But this brought out the first caution of the day from the streets of Chicago.
NASCAR on NBC. The rain is basically stopped falling here at Chicago, but the track is still wet. And luckily for us, we got my old buddy Dale Jr. and Mike all working down there at Turn 4. Jr., it's been an exciting start on these wet weather tires. What's been your opinion from your vantage point down there? I was super excited to see this race get going and watch the drivers face that challenge. Uh, in Turn 4, there's so many bumps getting down into the braking zone of that corner. It is a fast corner, so it's not a hard braking zone, but they are respecting not only the bumps, but what those could do to the car and how that could throw the car out of control. They're really, really respecting and cautious to the entry of that turn. They're, uh, you know, turn five's a first corner, uh, first gear corner, and they're nowhere near that. So they're, you know, they're probably in third, third gear through here, just gingerly trying to get through the center of four and five and then onto the long straightaway and not induce any real spin with any high RPMs like a second or first gear would do. So pretty impressive so far. I know there's been some accidents at other parts of the racetrack, but right down here, it's been pretty clean. The eight car of Kyle Busch, you see him a little bit of damage to the right front. Uh, Junior, I'm going to tell you, that was pretty breathtaking to see this hit to the tire barrier with the car having less damage. Absolutely, and the tire barrier does a perfect job. Uh, see all the water coming out of those tires, but that tire barrier, we've seen it do its job multiple times this weekend. Kyle's able to not only uh, climb out of that car if it were a, you know heavily damaged, but he's going to continue to race, and I think race well. When he came by here, I know there's some body damage, but tires are pointing in all the right directions. Um, as long as electronics and everything's okay inside the car, you saw a lot of water get inside there uh, during the wreck from the end car, but uh, as long as everything survives, I think the body damage you know, is, is not a big deal here, especially with the slow pace uh with the wet weather if it dries uh that that aero disadvantage may show up but i doubt it i think the team can can repair that and um he's got a lot more respect i guess for that corner than anyone else right now Rick. <laughs> yeah we're seeing race control has said that all starts and restarts will be single file until further notice and steve you mentioned that uh at the very beginning that they could be they could tell the drivers that it would be a single file restart we saw that last replay. That's our first time we've seen kind of that in car for Kyle Busch. You could hear the, the wheel hop, and here we come, Rick. Back down the front stretch and into the gas again. Out front, Tyler Reddick, and then Christopher Bell running second. Front end two coming into turn number one. That's the left hander onto Balbo. Everybody's safely through in front of the top 15 cars or so. Tyler Reddick starting to leg it out now, trying to pull away from the 20 of Christopher Bell as they exit turn two and race up Lakeshore Drive. How impressive has Tyler Reddick been so far in these conditions, just driving away from the field? And he looks really comfortable doing it. You have to imagine everybody's going to gain more and more confidence. And there'll be some drivers that will be able to match that pace, especially back here in the field. But a lot of difficult traffic, a lot of having to be patient with other drivers. Just trying to get through these part of the racetrack. There's, with the concrete, I believe that allows for a little more grip. Back down to you. Here they come into turn number six. Tyler Reddick away. He's in the 45. Further back, stacking up side by side in the 34 car. That's Michael McDowell. Daniel Suarez in the 99. Suarez is going to slide underneath. It'll grab the spot and try to gain traction all at the same time. McDowell's on a mission today. I called him this morning. I said, what do you think? He said, I think one thing, it's time to win. That's what's on his mind, and he views this as an opportunity. He is a good road racer. He has road race experience in the rain more than most of these guys, and he is going to try to take advantage of it. One of the big challenges he and everybody are going to have to deal with as he approaches turn, turn 11, which is directly underneath me, is there is puddling on the right side of the racetrack. You've got to stay to the left against that wall to stay out of those puddles. Riding on the back of Daniel Suarez's Xfinity Mobile, number 99, and Looking back from that camera, you see the 34, Michael McDowell continuing to put pressure on Suarez, trying to have him make a mistake so he can get by him. This is the race for the fourth position. Here they go, McDowell's gonna take a peek. McDowell's gonna jam it in deep. McDowell in the 34, he'll slide under Suarez, coming into the corner. They both are trying to get that traction out of turn number one, and Daniel Suarez is now in position to take the spot back in turn two. Wheel to wheel to Lakeshore Drive. To battle who can accelerate in these conditions down this long straightaway. McDowell taking the spot away now. The 22, Logano 
mixes it up with these guys all offline, trying to find some water here, trying to find out where they need to be. No dry lines through this particular part of the racetrack just yet, but watch these drivers during the straightaways get offline to seek out moisture to keep the temperature down in these tires. That's exactly what they're doing leaving turn five right now. You're watching the battle from fourth on back. Now here's the challenge that Daniel Suarez faces. Suarez is in the white car. Here's Joey Logano in that yellow number 22. Further back, Ty Gibbs in the green 54, and they're wheel to wheel. Denny Hamlin on the move as everyone begins to stack up headed to turn seven. Let's see how this side by side battle works out. Not much room down here in normal conditions, much less in the wet. Denny Hamlin making a good decision to give that spot up, did not want to go side by side into this section. Look at the uphill climb. And now they're going downhill right against that wall. See those puddles on the other side of the racetrack? Stay out of that. Stay in this groove. Everybody doing a really nice job down here so far. Back up the hill on Jackson Drive and still up front. It's Tyler Reddick. Christopher Bell has closed the gap, though, just a bit as he rockets down the front stretch. Battle for the lead. Christopher Bell in that 20 car slowly starting to close thing in. He's keeping Tyler Reddick in range until he slips just a tad off the corner. Here they come now over to Lakeshore Drive. This is turn two. That's the 90 degree right hander. Christopher Bell in that 20 car in hot pursuit of your race leader headed to three. Can Reddick be patient here as he sees Bell getting closer and closer? Can he be patient and not start pushing too hard and slip the car in a braking zone and end up in a tire barrier? Bell really doing an impressive job to be able to close that gap. He too sees himself closing in on Reddick. Battle for the lead. Tyler Reddick in the 45. Christopher Bell in the 20. They come out of five. And now they're going to set it for the braking zone. Hard on the brakes. They're going to drive it in deep. Bell drives it in just a tad deeper than Reddick. And they'll shut it down to a car length. They cut the left-hander turn six and set it for that downhill run over the bridge into seven. Bell's aggressiveness on corner entry is impressive. He's got to be careful not to overstep his bounds a little bit. Both of these drivers have a ton of dirt racing experience. You have to wonder if that slipping and sliding of dirt is paying advantage to him today. I love the fact that Christopher Bell, look how close he is to that wall. Watch him gain on corner entry here just a little bit. This is the heavy braking zone. See that right there? Christopher Bell is very comfortable with his race car under braking. And these top three have separated themselves from the field. Want to take a look at the Xfinity fastest lap. Reddick, Bell, Van Gisbergen. But it's Bell that has the fastest lap up to this point, averaging 75 miles per hour around this 2.2 mile road course, street course here in Chicago. Battle for the lead continues to tighten. Christopher Bell slowly catching Tyler Reddick. They are one and two. Trying to settle this amongst themselves, at least for now. They will leave turn one, and you're watching them come over to Lake Shore Drive. They're going to hang that right. Christopher Bell doing a great job keeping pace with the race leaders so far at this portion of this race. Got to give these Goodyear rain tires a lot of credit. These drivers feel really comfortable to be able to push. You can see the tire in the forgiveness that it has as they start to lean and slide these cars around on corner exit. Marty. And Junior, it's funny because I talked to Christopher Bell right before they fired up the cars and he said he was actually upset that it was raining. He said, well, our car was so good in the dry that I could not, I wanted it to be in the dry. I didn't want to, want to be in the wet today. So Bell still very quick. Look at Reddick slipping in front of you, Jeff. Oh, and he slips huge coming out of six. That's going to open up the inside lane for Christopher Bell. That was a costly mistake for Tyler Reddick, and that will earn Christopher Bell the lead. He hangs the right, turn seven, headed to Jeff. That was a mistake that Bell forced Reddick to make. We, we talked about how Bell could break so aggressively. Reddick was watching that. Reddick tried to match that tempo on corner entry, and his car would not do it. Christopher Bell, although he didn't move him out of the way, he forced Reddick into a mistake. Three drivers have been up front officially. Reddick had led every lap until now. Bell now up front in the field here in Chicago. He goes around and he will complete the ninth lap here.
Lidos, a pioneering Fortune 500 global technology and engineering giant, is at the forefront of breakthroughs in AI, hypersonics, space exploration, and more. Joining NASCAR's automotive expertise and Lidos advanced research, Lidos is designing the most advanced vehicle to ever touch the surface of the moon. Join us as we navigate this captivating journey. Over Lake Michigan and skies beginning to clear over Grant Park here in the city of Chicago as 10 laps are complete on lap 11 now. Some aggressive racing right here. Look at Corey LaJoy. He hangs a right on Alex Bowman. This is a very tight corner. That was such an aggressive move. I don't think Alex thought he would ever be there. Gets a good run, goes ahead and sends it in there. Puts Bowman in a position to have to get the spot up. Bowman tries to cross him over. Let's ride along with Denny Hamlin and check out what he saw. You see right there, he's trying to block that move. You have to wonder if you can get by with that all day long in this rain. I doubt it. There you see the battle for second, starting to tie it up. Tighten up between Reddick, his Bergen. And as you see also, these lap times are starting to drop. We're down to 103.19. They get faster and faster, not only understanding how to push these cars in the wet, but also understanding the changing track as it's continuing to dry. Everyone's improved except for Reddick. Reddick's not quite on the pace he was at the start. Now he's under threat of losing second spot. Reddick and Van Gisbergen right now racing for second, coming into turn six. This is happening just about three seconds behind race leader Christopher Bell, and it's happening 15 seconds ahead of Michael McDowell in fourth. They're downhill into seven. Let's ride along, SVG. Check out what he does. He's very unusual. Most drivers in the Cup Series do not use the clutch at all. As he approaches a braking zone, watch that left foot. No downshift there. So let's see right there, left foot, used the clutch, made the downshift. Most drivers don't do that anymore. He says he likes doing it, he's comfortable doing it. I doubt he even knows he's doing it. Some people think he's doing it for a competitive advantage, getting his car to turn better. Others think he's just a habit, using that clutch to downshift. With these modern transmissions, you don't have to use it. He's choosing to. And after qualifying, Shane Trouble, Van Gisbert. Trouble, turn six, Noah Gregson is in the tire barrier. He's nailed it, and he's doing a burnout, trying to get out of it, and he can't. He is stuck, leaving turn number six. Well, he's creating quite a smoke show at the same time. He just killed the engine. He's gonna need help to get out of this tire pack. He's another one that probably will want to continue. That's the exit of turn six before they go up over the bridge and into turn seven. He was running 34th, one of the two entries for Legacy Motorsports, of which Richard Petty, one of the co-owners there, and Richard Petty turning 86 today. It's his birthday. And then you see next to Noah Gregson's name there uh, on the right, JJ, uh, for Jimmy Johnson, one of the other co-owners. He was scheduled to run in this race until uh, tragedy in the family, uh, and he withdrew. Uh, respect the privacy of J.J. and his family, but thoughts and prayers out uh, to J.J. and everyone involved in his family. At this point, the safety workers and the recovery vehicles are going to have to do the same thing they did for Kyle Busch. You saw the two gentlemen right there basically clear the hook. They're going to pull them out. Let's take a look exactly what happened. Really much like Kyle Busch. He got a little bit further around the corner and going a little bit slower pace, but got wedged up underneath the tire barrier. And then as Mike Bagley really pointed out, put a bit of a smoke show trying to back that car out from underneath it. There's no telling how much those tires weigh, not to mention how much water is in them at this point. Um, the eight pulled out without a problem. We'll assume the same can happen at the 42. We're gonna get a look at it. Really depends on that angle too, probably if he nosed it in a little harder on the right side. See a full house on top of the pit box. Yeah. Luke Lambert, the crew chief, is the person closest in the Wendy's uniform at the bottom, bunch of sponsors. All the crew members wearing the 84, that would have been the number that Jimmy Johnson would have been running here in the race. And the safety crew now right there at the back bumper of the 42 for Noah Gregson. We'll see if they can pull him out and he can continue. 
Bagman, it's got to be a little bit tight right there, looking down from your perch as to the cars rolling by. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking right down on the racetrack. And of course, when Noah was trying to back away uh, and putting up all the smoke, there were some drivers that were trying to make their way through. You had that to deal with. And now there are three safety vehicles here that are tending to him. And the drivers are just barely squeezing by on the inside. There is a lane to work with, but they don't have much grace. There's Noah out from the tire pack, put the tow rope away. And then Noah Gregson's going to fire up and move away from the accident scene in turn six. It's been pretty amazing. We've seen two cars get actually underneath the tire barriers in turn six, and both of them have been resilient enough that they're still able to run. We'll see if the 42 is going to be able to continue. Turn six has been tough, though. NASCAR Fan Rewards is free to join. That means you can earn points all season by just watching races. You can answer trivia, play fantasy, buy race tickets, and more. You save your points, you trade them in for free tickets, autograph merchandise, exclusive NASCAR gear, and one-of-a-kind race day experiences. Just visit NASCAR.com slash Fan Rewards. have seen a lot of racing gear around this road course, street course, uh, with all the fans showing their appreciation and their favorite drivers wearing a lot of the gear. Marty. Rick Ryan Blaney was going backwards. He's one of the cars that comes down pit road. He uh, miss, misses a contact there, almost contact with Kevin Harvick. Bubba Wallace also on pit road. It was fuel only for Blaney. Harvick is going to take tires here, but see for the guys up front, just too early and too close to the end of the stage to give up all that track position. Yeah, Marty, I have to agree. And Marty, make sure you keep me honest here. It seems like the rain tires the Goodyear is like a, a white, as we're on the Bush Light Correct. cam, right? It's a white Goodyear, that's how I'm, because we're gonna see a, a conversion here, right? Guys are gonna start gambling on the drying up and they're gonna jump to you. That's a great shot of the sidewall of that treaded tire. You can't read it, but it turns white pretty solid versus the yellow. If you get the right angle, you can tell the difference. It's a little harder than you would think um, in the rain, but we'll try to keep a track on who's on slicks, who's on treads. Right now, the whole field though, still on wet weather tires. 
Two cautions. We're under the second one now. And while we have a little break in the action, let's go to the Peacock Pit Box and check in with DJ and Brad. Hey, guys, already we've seen a lot of aggressive moves taking place around this track. Yeah, and DJ, you know, we've had a successful 14 laps with six to go on this stage. We see the temperature coming up just a little bit, but are we getting to the point to where we're going to see guys become even more aggressive as we get towards the end of this stage? Yeah, I think that it's only going to ramp up as this goes on. They're figuring out what they can and can't do, some by trial and error and losing on that side of yeah. it. But, they, yeah, they're going to continue you to be aggressive here. That's what you have to be. There's no way to hide around this racetrack. Yeah. And if you can take advantage and get yourself positioned better right now, that's only going to enhance your chances later on down the road. I'll just tell you one thing. I know some of them are talking about slicks. I'd tell them to put my slicks way back away from pit wall because I don't want those anytime soon is what I see with this track. <laughs> DJ don't want no slicks, Rick. <laughs> the word slicks no is slicks not the right DJ. word right now with the track as slick as it is. I'm going to tell you. There's a lot of things as a crew chief I think I would sell. You know, maybe we should pin here. Maybe we should save some fuel. After what I've seen, there's zero chance I'm trying to sell my driver. We need to put some slick tires as we're on board with Reddick and his Toyota on board. I think that's a driver decision because there's zero chance in 12 corners that all 12 are going to be ready at the same time. It's, uh, you know, let's we'll look. We're on with Almendinger right here, Northern Tool and Equipment reasonably dry right here. While it's wet, no standing water. Danny Hamlin with that Coca-Cola Zero Sugar can. But, I mean, there is some real damp spots, especially right here. And NASCAR has deemed that this is, once again, a single file restart, the restart zone. You see the pace car going through it now. Up in front, it is Christopher Bell, Tyler Reddick, Ben Gisbergen, and Mark Truex Jr., Michael McDowell, the top five. Up through the gears they go again. We'll see how well Bell pulls away from Reddick as they go down across the start-finish line and into turn number one. Christopher Bell off to a great start. Tyler Reddick in hot pursuit. They stack it up single file. They will turn to the left. That's turn one. They turn on to Balbo Drive. Watching them now begin to realign themselves for the approach to turn two. Nobody doing anything dramatic or anything crazy right now. They're just trying to get themselves back up to speed, and they'll do it, clearing two and heading to Lakeshore Drive. See back there in the fourth position, Martin Tricks Jr. He's a hot man right now in the series. One of the best at the road course is closing in on his Bergen into turn four. The top three were running two seconds faster than the field before this caution. Let's see if some of these guys have caught up. Now they've caught up. Can they match the lap time? They have left turn five. Here they come, down shifting and on the brakes and driving in deep. Tyler Reddick's trying to make up some real estate. That's Reddick in that green and black 45. Here comes everybody now. Going to hug the inside. That's Daniel Suarez in the white car. Kyle Larson in the blue and white car. They clear the bridge and now race down into seven. Little side-by-side -side action there as Alex Bowman in the 48 and Corey LaJoy once again. It seems like these two have a fight that they're trying to resolve and it hasn't been resolved yet. LaJoy now on his back bumper. Bowman looks like he's running scared out in front. Not sure what Corey LaJoy will do as they work their way through 11 and LaJoy even puts the bumper to the back of Bowman. Now up over the bridge and to turn 12, the final turn. And just behind them, Ryan Priest in the 41, able to clear that 14 of Briscoe. But Briscoe fires back on the inside. Their door to door as they go down the front stretch. Dale Earnhardt Jr. talks about disagreements on the racetrack. These guys have been at odds ever since the green flag fell. Behind them, side by side, into one. That is Ryan Priest in the 41. These drivers are teammates. Got Briscoe in the 14 right there. Set up for two. And Briscoe will give way, allow Priest to complete that pass, and they'll single out now as they head to three. Priest all the way up to 16th here over his teammate Briscoe Chastain right behind him, who is one of the biggest movers since the start of the race, plus 12 positions for Chastain. Byron also up 12 positions, as is his teammate Chase Elliott. So some big movers in the field. Watching Ross Chastain on board with him inside of the race car and following the top from his race car. Right now he is in the 18th position. Here he comes into turn number six. He's gonna try to ease it into the corner right now, but he's got some drivers that are stacked up behind him. He will just cut turn six and 
not take that wide approach because he's trying to get set up for that downhill run into turn seven. He'll cross the bridge. He'll make the right-hander onto Michigan Avenue, and then that will set him up for that unique and technical set of corners that make up turns 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. Yeah, kind of the Congress loop right here, a big, long, sweeping. This corner right here, though, turn 10, it, it's kind of a, almost just a kink, a very fast section. You see how much water is there. That definitely looks like the wettest part of the racetrack, the entry into turn 11. Now we're heading across to turn 12. Everyone kind of in line, pretty organized. You see the map on the upper right-hand side of the screen. You see the one of Chastain, even though he's running in the 18th position, a good distance behind the 20 bell, the leader. Yeah, 14 seconds behind is Ross Chastain right now. Here he comes up the front straightaway, and he's trying to catch Chase Briscoe. He's right in front of him. That would be the battle for the 17th position. Ross looks pretty calm inside the car, not making any sudden movements as he makes the right into turn number two. Dale, is that does that surprise you? I mean, he has a lot of ground to make up, but he's not forcing any issues right now. Such a long way to go, and you're on a racetrack that's continuing to change. Down here where I'm at, I believe we're gonna start seeing this track dry out quite a bit. I'm already seeing it in some of the cracks of the racetrack where this concrete surface is beginning to dry, right in the apex of turn four, beginning to dry out. Really, really wet where Burton is, but drying out on the other end of the racetrack. So these drivers need to find moisture on the straightaways. Try not to allow them tires to overheat. Starting to see a little bit of drying from turns five to turn six there on Columbus Drive. Out front with a 1.3 second lead is Christopher Bell. It's a NASCAR Cup Series Chicago Street Race. The Grant Park 220 on NBC. Still out front is Christopher Bell. They're coming up on the end of stage one. Again, a caution will not be thrown 
at the end of the stage but the top 10 drivers will all earn stage points and the winner of the stage gets a playoff point and they can carry that in to the playoffs and through the playoffs as long as they are there but Bell right now aggressively making his way around he just came out of the Xfinity 10 G turn and through 11 and up to 12 and Bell looking to grab the stage win it will be his first stage win this year as he makes that hard right hand turn onto the front stretch and across the start finish line for the win of stage one and it looks like things heating up behind him Tyler Reddick and Shane Van Gisbergen getting a little closer together as they finish second and third in stage one Mark Truex Jr. Michael McDowell rounding out the top five and it's Suarez Larson Allmendinger Gibbs and Jensen Button all part of the top 10. Steve, we're starting to see some cars on pit road. I think really we're starting to see some dry lines. So the real issue will be, do they take wet tires or dries? I think it's time to make the swap, Marty. Yeah, and that's what a lot of teams have been debating. In fact, on the race course, you mentioned it a moment ago with these rain tires, drivers have been trying to find slick parts of the racetrack to keep their tires cool. So a lot of teams coming in here. We'll see if they all go to slicks, Kim. And for Chase Briscoe, he was saying forward drive just is not great. They had a little trouble there on that rear tire, and he needed it to not slide across the center. So looking for some air pressure adjustments on the 14 of Chase Briscoe. Now, I think this is one of the toughest things for a race car driver. You've been out there on treaded tires. Now, as you see the 14 rejoin, these are the yellow sidewalls. You saw the yellow Goodyear, so we know they're on slicks. So it's easy to say the track is drying, but these slicks do not have much traction if the track is still damp. So Briscoe here, oh man, you yeah. see how slick just that Ginger. corner is right there. Front tire's not working. Junior, as he heads down to turn four, this entry is gonna be very delicate. This has gotta be one of the toughest things that a driver would do, unwillingly almost, to put on slicks in wet conditions. Now there is a dry line through this particular part. You see it on the screen, dry through here, but if you get offline just a little bit, it's wet and damp. Now as we go to this end of the racetrack, Bagley, the track gets wetter and wetter down toward Jeff Burton. It does. It does get drier here on the outer approach to turn five, but turn six, or six that is, turn six is still damp and he slips just a tick coming off the corner. Jeff, this is gonna be interesting as he heads to you. This is the part I'm concerned about on slicks. I just don't know. You see the entry is starting to dry. The exit's a little bit dry, but up through this part of the racetrack, I'm nervous about it. There's a lot of water running across as he starts downhill. This is the part you're gonna have to be careful. See, he missed the bottom right there. That's because there's no grip. This is where he better tiptoe. Very nervous about it. See all that water standing there? I'm really nervous for anybody on slicks at this part of the racetrack. It will be the last part of the racetrack to dry. Now, Rick, if he can manage that wet section by just going easier, remember, it's total lap time. So even if he has to go way slower in front of Jeff in turn 11, but he has a chance to go way faster in front of either Bagley here at turn one, you know, what is the net game? That's the goal here, Bagley. Oh, trouble turn six, Joey Logano into the tire barrier. Matter of fact, he'll nail it, he'll back away, but he has torn some of the covering of the tire pack away. That was impact that we had from Logano, but he was able to get away and will not need a tow back out onto the racing surface. You see the big impact in, and then you see the barrier, kind of that sheathing come loose. It's far enough offline. I don't think it will cause a yellow. If a yellow does come out, I'm sure that they will attend to it, but Logano back up and running, and I'm telling you, these cars are resilient as we see Logano able to continue on. It almost looks like he hasn't been involved in anything. And then the 15. Guys, Jensen Guys, Button is around coming to pit road. Jensen Button now tries to get it right, and he almost hits Joey Logano. So Button was coming to pit road, and he got tagged from behind. At the same time, Stenhouse missed turn 11. I'm sorry, turn 12, turn 11. He had to run off into the runoff area, got turned around and back on track. They're putting the slicks on the 15 of Jensen Button. You see again the yellow lettering on these Goodyear tires. And everybody's watching lap times of the cars on slick. Let's see what exactly happened to Button. He's kind of a little high. Oh, there's contact. We talked about how di difficult it was going to be to get onto pit road. You wonder if the car behind the 15, I couldn't make out the car number, even knew he was pitting. And then Joey Logano comes around the corner and sees a car sitting broadside in front of him. 
Button was up high enough. Do you think he was trying to make the turn there and just got tagged? And I he believe was just he a was. High? I believe he, he was. He was pitting. No, he was pitting for sure, guys, definitely. And I think it was Busher who was behind yeah, him. Yeah, Dave, I think you're absolutely right. Kind of similar colored cars. There is a yellow line there when you come through turn number 12 that the drivers, they would try to get on the inside of the yellow line. He was a little bit outside of it. Maybe he just wasn't, uh, Chris Busher wasn't expecting him to turn right there because he was higher. Yeah, let's go back and look. See how high the 15? You're exactly right, Rick. If you're behind him and you see him leaving that high, you're not thinking he's pitting. And that's just inexperience that Jensen Button has in our series. Knowing how to signal to the guy behind you without using your hand, no gestures whatsoever, just the placement of your car, no way they knew behind him he was pitting. Now we're in a very right awkward spot. Sorry, Rick, of transition. You see Denny Hamlin come to pit road, Marty. Coming down pit road, Denny Hamlin, who started from the pole, had that spin, kind of hung around the top 10 for much of this run. So they're all going to slicks here, see, but this is about a lap or two earlier than the leaders wanted to pit. You'll see his teammate Christopher Bell come very soon, leading right now, Dave. And William Byron got on the slick Goodyear tires as well. He went from 32nd to 17th on that, on that run, and uh, that's important because he needs points. He's trying to win that regular season championship. I hear what Marty's saying about what we consider the fuel windows to be, but I just have to ask myself as I look at lap time so much slower because of the wet, they may be getting better fuel economy. Remember, if you can't push the throttle down, you can't burn, burn as much gas. You see how dangerous pit out can be. 48 on the racetrack, 24 leaving. Yeah, on slicks now. So William Byron trying to get a good feel for what it's like to be on slicks on this somewhat dry racetrack. And I'm still watching lap time, Rick. That's going to be the telltale for me. And still the fastest cars on the racetrack are the 20, the 91, and the 45, who are all on rain tires leading the race. Coming right at you. Uh, now we have Van Gisbergen, who is in second. An issue there. Gilliland of 38 gets turned around. And you see the yellow Goodyears. That tells me the 38 is on those slicks we talked about. Just found a little bit of a damp spot. I think this makes the racing so much more exciting. OK, Truex from fourth comes to pit road. You see it on the pylon on the left side of your screen. That is going to generate some concern in the top three, Marty. And you saw Ryan Blaney there on the screen as well. He had a contact on the track a moment ago. They have cleared the DVP, but right now Blaney in 37th. Truex coming to pit road. He said the rears were absolutely gone on these rain tires. And I think you're going to see his teammate Christopher Bell. You're also going to see Tyler Reddick come down pit road. The 12th car also, as we mentioned a moment ago, Ryan Blaney in last. And here's that replay for Blaney making that contact earlier. They were on the DVP, they cleared the DVP, and here's the onboard for Ryan Blaney. Listen to this. Wow, that impact for Blaney. They did clear the DVP, so Blaney back out. It's been a tough couple of weeks for that race team. DVP, damage vehicle policy, basically rules. If you have any sort of damage, you're only allowed to spend so much time on pit road. That's what Marty was talking about. It's been cleared, which means he, he's basically free and clear for the rest of the race like it never happened except for the wear and tear on the car. It did happen. They reset the clock, but to reset the clock, you've got to make a minimum speed around here. So obviously that would have been a little more challenging yeah. because of the wet weather conditions. Yeah, but they they got there. Oh, no, the nine of Chase Elliott. Also into the tire barriers. And he's able to get off. You see the yellow Goodyear tires. In turn two. This is in turn two. I'm trying to look at the monitor to see when he was last on pit road. It looks like he had just left pit road. So that is cold sticker tires for the nine. That just shows how dangerous it is. Marty, the 20 in front of you. Yeah, Chase Elliott did just pit, Steve. And yes, it's tough on those slick tires. He had made so much progress talking about Chase Elliott. Usually the game in these wet tire races, who gets on the slicks first? Remember, Truex pitted a lap earlier. You see Tyler Reddick on the bottom of the screen as well. Everybody going to slicks here and trying to baby the car as best they can. Reddick has a tough time getting out of his stall. So now we'll see where the bell, where Bell blends and the 45 blends versus the rest of the field. Back on the racetrack, you see, oh, babying those tires. The 20, oh, man, it's so difficult. He's right out in traffic. That was the 78 of Josh Balicki, that yellow 78 that is running just in front of Christopher Bell. Again, before he came to pit road, he was the race leader. And Gisbergen now scored as the race leader until he comes to pit road. Riding along with the enhanced health on board. 
Still, the puddles through turns 10 and 11 before they come up this hill to turn 12. Van Gisbergen trying to get by the six of Brad Kozlowski. And now he comes to pit road. So the race leader on pit road, Dave. And this will be one of the things that Shane has never done before. Taking a next gen car to pit road. Can he hit his marks cleanly and give the crew an opportunity to change those Goodyear tires? Well, yes, he does. He will get the slicks as well. So Shane Van Vigisbergen winning, actually leading for the first time in NASCAR. He'll get credited for leading one lap. Now he'll drop back into the pack with the fresh tires and see what he can do from there. So look at the map on the upper right hand side of the screen. You see the 51 leaving, the 20 coming around the last corner. I believe the 51 right here is about the middle of the front stretch. Excuse, excuse me, the 91. Here's the 20, who's the first car on brand new tires, and this is going to be very important, really for position. And Christopher Bell stays in front of the 91 on the pit cycle. So as both tires move forward to slick tires, Christopher Bell holds his position relative to the 91. Steve, he was about 2.1 seconds back from Bell before that pit cycle went through. A lot of troubles around the racetrack. Turn two, turn six have been the most hectic up to this point. I'm Noah Gregson, driver of the number 42 Wendy's Camaro in the NASCAR Cup Series, and I'm always Baconating. I'm not kidding. Check out our videos on the NBC Sports YouTube page. Where do you think you get an outfit like that? Bacon from head to tail, head to toe. That's pretty impressive. Aerial coverage brought to you by Pods. Moving the summer, save up to 30% at pods.com today. 28 laps complete on lap 29. There are 17 still to go in stage two. And Van Gisbergen with Reddick tucked in behind. They are chasing after Christopher Bell, who is the race leader. And you're starting to see a very defined dry line. You can see these two cars running in it. We started under very heavy, wet conditions. The dries 
the drivers took to the track. And as they continue to run, it created this dry line. So there's really been this pit transition from wet tires to slick tires. Wet tires really are just a treaded version of the Goodyear tire. It's what you would have in your street car at home. The slick tires are the type of tires that these cars run on all the ovals. They're zero tread. They're perfectly smooth. That rubber kind of heats up, it's sticky, and, and sticks to the track. And the trick, Marty, is if it's wet enough, the groove tires are faster. But when the dry areas start to show up, if you can manage it, the slick tires overall have more speed. Yeah, I think that's the key, right, Steve? If you can manage it, we saw Chase Elliott Trouble, the best turn in the six, business. Noah Gregson's into the tire barrier again, and he's stuck again. He's trying to back it up. He can't do it. He's wedged in into the tire pack in turn number six, as everybody will race by to his inside. And will it bring out a caution? It does, as he is not able to get rolling. So they will have to help him get out of that tire barrier. Turn six has been his nemesis today. Yeah, this is like the first time, not his fault. He kind of got taken off in there with his teammate. But this is a couple times that the 42 has definitely made contact with this tire barrier. Marty. Well, just to finish what we were saying, Rick, I wanted to show those tires Steve was talking about up close. So, so yes, the slicks here, yellow, and they are very slick, as you can see, and so tough to hand to hang on to on the racetrack. Here are the treaded tires, Steve. Like you said, just like your passenger car at home, the treads, and it kind of wicks the water away from the tire, but they have that white sidewall. In fact, there were some teams that had these on well into the run here. Bubba Wallace just pitted a moment ago and took these tires off, but they are so hard to hang on to Without water on the track, Steve, the drivers actually have to go seek it out to keep them cool. Because yeah, not only is it treaded, so there's less tire touching the ground, but it's much softer, gummier tire. So heat is its nemesis. It, it's designed to create heat in the wet. So when it gets dry, it gets so hot, it really starts tearing the tire apart. You kind of start searching for puddles like a kid. You know, you look for <laughs> puddles to jump in. That's what a race car driver on, on wet tires do. To keep your shoes cool, is that why you do it as a kid? Well, the these kids have found a little bit of wet weather conditions on the track, Noah Gregson included.
NBC Sports coverage of NASCAR is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Save when you bundle auto, home, and motorcycle insurance. Visit Progressive.com. Credit One Bank, a credit card company. And by Pods. Moving this summer, save up to 30% at Pods.com today. There's Field Museum of Natural History there in the background. As you can take advantage of NASCAR Drive at your race day companion, able to follow your favorite drivers with access to their in-car cameras. Just visit NASCAR.com slash drive, or you can download the NASCAR mobile app to watch all of the action. We'll have a restart, and last time we heard from NASCAR, it was single file restart. And while they're getting single file, let's check in with Parker Kligerman. Well, Rick, I just want to give a shout out to this first ever Chicago street course crowd here. Remember, just a couple hours ago, it's pretty horrible conditions around here, torrential downpour. But as this race has gone on, I've walked around this whole racetrack to different corners and different points, and it's been amazing to see the fans coming out in droves, getting up against the fences, sometimes five, seven deep against the fences in areas where they just want to see these race cars. So it's awesome to see this crowd return here when the weather got a little better and those race cars fired up and started racing. You know, race cars just attract everyone to come out here right after the rain. It's been pretty cool to see. Yes, it has. And you mentioned the torrential downpour. There, there has been over two inches of rain that has fallen just today, and so just this morning. So uh, really a tip of the cap to everyone here that has put on this event, all of the street workers that have been helping out and making sure that this racing surface has gotten to the condition it is now that we've been able to see already 30 laps of this race complete. You mentioned Rick, we're kind of, it was a pretty hectic first 32 laps for us started in the wet. We're moving into the dry. You're going to see uh, some red flashing lights probably still on the back of the race cars. I think that's still required if you're allowed to run wet tires. Everyone here is on those dry slicks that we just kind of showed you. Marty gave you a great example how what they actually look like. Um, but now it's kind of a big reset. Everybody from here is probably looking for one more pit stop. Christopher Bell leads. Um, the New Zealander running second in Van Gisbergen doing a, just a remarkable job. You're on board with Hamlin. He was the pole sitter. He kind of got off track really early, and now he's, he's kind of riding there in 12th. Now it's kind of, a, you know, it's a little more, I don't want to call it straightforward, but I think the drivers now have a better idea how their cars drive now that they've been in the dry a little bit. And now, Dave, it's all about communicating to your team to make adjustments. And Steve, whenever NASCAR races on a road course or now street courses, we keep our eye on A.J. Allmendinger, who's running seventh. Uh, A.J. just reported that the brakes are miserable. The car won't turn. He's not real happy with it, but that's normal. And he's won a couple of times when he's complained about his race car. Team asked him to be big picture about the whole thing. He said, I get the big picture. Just don't want to get run over out here. You see the numbers there. One of the very few that have so much experience on road courses, Cup, Xfinity, IndyCar, and IMSA for A.J. Allmendinger. Let's check back in with the Peacock Pit Box and D.J. and Brad. All right, Brad, uh, interesting racing so far. Yep. I, I mean, the guys have done a great job, even though some have had more problems than others there. But yeah. uh, some things that we can go through here with the race recap. Uh, rain all day. I can't even believe that we're at this point with what we saw this morning, the amount of rain that has come down. and and filled this track. Yeah, there's so much water, but then we fire off. Denny Hamlin's on the pole. He sends that thing down into turn one. Got to a great job tiptoeing around this racetrack, trying to find some, some dry patches if they possibly can. And then the first caution, or the first spin, not caution, was Eric Almarola. Yeah, and then uh, these guys tried to get in, turn six down here, a little too hot. Eric Jones kind of created that. Uh, Denny Hamlin, our pole sitter, uh, tried to get a little bit more than what his car would give him there in turn two. Kyle Busch. Well, Kyle goes in there really, really hard and sends it in, but he's able to get out and, and, and move on. He's still racing. What a hard hit. See that got put back. Here comes Noah uh, once again. This will be the second time he's been in the turn six uh, yep. barrier yep. there. But it's just such a, a corner that you want to gain some speed, uh, just not enough grip there. Still a little bit down. I wonder if there was a Baconator down there, but then you see <laughs> Christopher Bell, who's been really, really fast since the beginning of the race. He took the lead over, did a great job, got ahead. You saw Jensen Button trying to come in down, trying to come down pit road, got turned around. Yeah, he's got to be further right than that and need to hand out the window letting these guys know because that's part of it. Here that Baconator. comes Noah yeah. once again with his low lights. Uh, that wasn't a highlight for real for Noah. Stay away from turn six before old Noah. 
But yeah, it's it's been interesting. But the guys, as we talked about in the last stage, you know, it's starting to ramp up. And when they get on these slicks, now we know we're really going to start seeing some aggressive racing as these tires start to come in a little bit. You know, I, I wondered what may happen with Christopher Bell there when yeah. he switched over. But once they got a couple of laps and he got back in his rhythm, he really was beating the second and third place cars by more than a second per lap. So it was just yeah. incredible. But, uh, you know, we're here. This is happening. We talked about what a great place it is to be. And uh, the sights, the sounds, everything. I mean, it just doesn't get much better than this. And we're racing hard, and it's only going to get better. Yep. Taking a look at the Toyota driver update. Bell up there in the lead. Reddick is third, fourth. Martin Truex Jr. Ty Gibbs is ninth. And the pole winner, Denny Hamlet, currently in the 12th position. We'll see if he can work his way back up front. Skyline here of Chicago. The backdrop for this historic race for NASCAR. Denny Hamlin has that number one pit stall. And Already 32 laps complete of the 100. Steve, one thing that might come into play here is darkness. There aren't lights around this track, and because they started just a little bit later uh, and not getting as many turns as they have been able to and up to speed, it could be an issue. And back across the start finish line, Bell pulling away now from Brand. Gisbergen, and here comes Reddick looking to the inside, fighting for that second spot. Reddick's going to send it on into the inside. He's going to slide across the nose of Gisbergen now in turn number one. Christopher Bell in that red car at the bottom of your screen. He's away with the lead, and the traffic stacks up from second on back. Now leading that battle is Tyler Reddick to turn three. And Daniel Suarez is getting mixed up in here in the 99 car as he goes by Truex. Here comes the five. Truex really loose right there in the water. Got to lock up behind him. Kyle Larson and Truex side by side into turn four. Everybody gets through there clean. 
great battle in here on these restarts. I think the tip, I think the uh, tempo's picking up, guys. Yeah, Martin Truex Jr. just trying to regain some lost ground. Christopher Bell is checked out. You're on board with A.J. Allmendinger as the field works their way down Columbus Drive into turn number six. Allmendinger now will clear that spot, clear that turn, that is, and work his way to turn seven. Turn seven down here again, this sharp right-hander. You can see the dry lane, and you can see the intensity picking up. Drivers are trusting the racetrack. They're trusting the grip. Even downhill into this right-hander, the Xfinity 10G turn. I'm amazed that they're that confident. Look at all the wetness on this part of the racetrack, but they're still attacking, still racing each other. That's the wettest part of the track right there, Jeff, in front of you and they go through there gingerly. But then, once they're able to come out of 12 and get back into the gas, Bell, again, trying to pull away one second already over Reddick. Tyler Reddick now in the second position, dropping back to the battle for fourth. Kyle Larson in that car right there, that number five, he has it. Daniel Suarez, we ride on board with in the Xfinity Mobile. Right now, he's tried to take it away. Off turn two, up Lakeshore Drive, as Larson will gap it by about three car lengths. Daniel Suarez did some testing in Trans Am at Detroit. Went and raced the Trans Am race at Nashville with the Indy cars. So has some street racing experience. I think that's paying off for him right here. They chase the five car, Larson. His burger right in front of him. For the greater part of the last 10, 15 laps or so, these two have been inseparable. Daniel Suarez, Kyle Larson racing for position. Here's Larson on the attack to the inside of Hisbergen now. He'll grab the spot. The lane is left open up. Here comes Daniel Suarez in the 99, downhill to seven. This is part of cup racing that when drivers come from other series, they're shocked at how aggressive cup drivers are. Australian supercars, they're also very aggressive, but this is when they tend to lose spots after restarts. Our guys get up on it. They know it's important to get track position. They get very aggressive. They step up their game, and SVG is going to have to do the same. Well, SVG has dropped back a bit now, as you mentioned. They're getting a little more aggressive in front of him, and now he's starting to see just the level of competition that he is fighting against. Dave. And in all of that, look at what Kyle Larson has done in the blue and white number five car. He has now raced his way up a couple of positions after a good pit stop in and out on the green flag cycle, gained spots there, and Larson is going after it. A lot of coaching for him in the early parts of the race, but now he is being very aggressive and going forward in the five. Incredible drive by Larson right here. Still getting a little bit of pressure back there from Suarez. Almost full out through turn three there into the braking zone, turn four over the bumps. Track really drying out through this area right now. A lot of grip. Look at them slide the cars. Larson out really wide and driving away. Kyle Larson has been very aggressive in the wet, and now he's even more so aggressive in the dry. He has cleared all the cars behind him. He's running in position number three, bringing Suarez along for the ride that you're riding with right now as they try to track down the front two in Bell and Reddick. Yeah, you can see how aggressive. Look, watch the five car. Watch it actually hop. It actually moves around, and it'll pick up, almost pick the tire up off the ground. That shows you how much grip the racetrack has. When it was wet, the cars just slid around. Now, they're actually bouncing and moving around. Tires are fully in this racetrack. Grip level back up. Look at the progressive telemetry of Daniel Suarez. Watch him hard on the throttle and back off again. And around turn 12. Kim. And we know Daniel can get around road course type tracks turning left and right. He won Sonoma last year, but when I talked to crew chief Travis Mack, he said having SVG has been tremendously helpful in terms of learning how to attack the racetrack, where to find speed on this course. The crew chief, the drivers, the entire team over at Trackhouse have done a deeper dive into the SMT data of SVG, and it's just added depth to what their notebook has been this weekend. Coming right at you again, Junior. Yeah, Christopher Bell is just annihilating this field right now. Only car in the 91 second bracket. Everybody else about a second off. Let's look at Truex right here. Trying to make this pass on Gisbergen to the inside. Down into turn one, makes it work. It's really a one lane track. He gets loose on corner X and loses the spot back. It's a one lane track, one line of drive. Everything else is wet.
turning on to Michigan and heading right at you, Jeff Burton. Yeah, I love this race. And you can see Martin Truex Jr. He just shifted in there, hoping to get SVG to back up. He didn't do it. He checked up early and just turned back underneath him. Really great racing. It's kind of racing we expected to see. We got to this racetrack. We got on the track. We realized it is going to be a racy, little fun racetrack. And we've seen it so far. Tyler Reddick, then Kyle Larson, Daniel Suarez, Mengus Bergen, Truex Jr. all in line going by the pit road, Dave. And Shane Van Gisberg in the blue and white 91. He's clawing back now, but his team is getting a kind of play-by-play -play they don't like. Listen. Radio check, radio check. They're hearing every single shift up, every single shift down. His microphone is hung open. Those electronics in the weather. You try to move as much out of the way as possible, but you get any sort of, you know, rain or moisture in those electronics, they just seem to quit working. The good news there, if his mic's quit open, stuck open, then the driver can't hear. You see him looking down. You wonder if he knows there's an issue, looking at the steering wheel, trying to figure out if he can fix something. And all that's happening while he's trying to go up to the gearbox, down to the gearbox, brake, accelerate. He's doing a good job managing that situation inside the race car while obviously maintaining a spot inside of the top five. And the track is, continues to get quicker and quicker, guys. More and more cars running one ni or 91 second laps. Most of the field in the 92s and 93s. And right now we see him going through the Xfinity 10G turn, but it's Bell who has been dominant once he's been up front, led 27 laps already.
This time next week, the Cup Series once again will be racing prime time, but next week it is Atlanta. And Steve, oh my goodness, Chase Elliott got the win a year ago, but he might have to have a win if he's going to get into the playoffs. And Atlanta is definitely not an easy track if you have to win somewhere. Yeah, the solid, smallest drafting super speedway type track. We see it's only a mile and a half, but they're rates like Daytona and Talladega in packs, bumper to bumper drafting off one another. Yeah. Crash, crash down here, turn 11, bowling around. He made contact. He's up against the wall, trying to let traffic go by. There's a little opening right here. He's trying to go in it. He's not going to be able to get turned around. I hope all the spotters are letting him know he's here. Now he's going to have to wait. There's another small opening coming. Let's see if he sits there. He just needs to sit, sit, sit. Almost the end of the line. There's still four or five more cars yet to go. He was 11, and did they change from a blue to a yellow flag? It looks like they did. They've gone to caution. There was a blue flag there, but now because he couldn't get it fired back up, it goes to caution. Yeah, you see contact right here. And he was just, both of them looked like their cars were moving around a lot. He and the 11 car got together. It almost looked like they both were in the corner too deep. The contact, and around he went. Go back and watch that again. Yeah, let's watch it from an onboard. Denny Hamlin, yeah, hear that right there. He's sliding, they're both sliding. You could hear Denny Hamlin off the gas and you could almost hear the tires shaking as he was trying to get it slowed down. I thought both of them were in deep. Ultimately, Hamlin got into the back of him. So, so as we are right on board right here with Denny Hamlin, you could see the very still overcast skies and look how much the lights, like the caution lights and all, we're still, you know, 90 minutes from scheduled sunset, but this is anything but a bright sunny day. So Marty, with 60 laps to go, that is nowhere near a fuel window to 100. But if you think we're racing darkness, this is decision time for the leaders. Do you pit now, thinking we may only run to say 80 laps? Yes, Steve, 60 laps to go, or are there 60 laps to go? That's what Adam Stevens is thinking with Christopher Bell. As you see, Alex Bowman limp down pit road. That's critical because he's very near the cut line. Adam Stevens is worried about the darkness that is obviously coming here this evening and how many laps would be left in the race. So if you're Adam Stevens, you're leading the race like you are, like Christopher Bell, his driver, what do you do here, Steve? There's five laps to go in stage two. You want those points. Do you pit here thinking, hey, we may be racing to a different number than lap 100. Well, pit road was closed that time by. I could see the red light as it came through. So no options to pit. Pit road doesn't open automatically. It's manually opened and uh, it's going to be a tough decision. You hope that NASCAR would give this information, but they may not have it. They, they haven't made a decision yet, Rick. Decision time. You see Alex Bowman contact and around he goes. Dealing with the elements here at the streets of Chicago.
we're talking about getting close to sunset. We're also getting close to dinner time, and all those Wendy's reads are making me hungry. <laughs> well, here in Chicago, you got plenty of options with the deep dish pizza. You got the Chicago dogs. So right here, we see the leaders passing pit road. The green light is on. So these, so the idea would be you only want to pit one more time. There are 59 laps to go. You see some takers back in the field. Um, New tires are a little advantage, but not big enough to give up track position. So you only want to pit after you're inside your window. We see William Byron coming to pit road right here. Kim. And for Joey Logano and this team, they are playing a strategy card. Knew they didn't have the position or the car to win. They think we are not racing to lap 100. We are chasing darkness. So they are electing to come in and make what they think is their last stop of the day here, Marty. So, Ken, this is an interesting move. Kevin Harvick coming down pit road, the Bushlight onboard camera as he comes down to Rodney Childers. So, pitting here, they should be able to get to like lap 80 or so. They're at the back of the pack. They kind of have nothing to lose. The leaders, though, if they, they, they should come around lap 62, 63. So, an interesting move. If we are indeed, Steve, racing to darkness around lap 80, they think they've made the right move here to be out when everybody else fits. If you're an Alex Bowman fan, you unfortunately see the hood up on the 40. I don't believe it's damage from the spin, uh, but the engine has gone into this protection mode. Electronics on the engine. So, so from what we hear from the team, they're trying to figure out why the car thinks it needs to run at a lower RPM. Frustrating. And Parker, once again, you're at a vantage point that uh, very few people get to experience here. Right, Rick, and I've been able to walk around this entire racetrack, the Chicago street course. I have to say, this where I'm right now, this patio over turn 12 is one of the most surreal experiences I've had in NASCAR. As you look over my left shoulder, that is the Chicago skyline. There's all these people hanging out, watching race cars, though, below them about 20 feet, coming off turn 12 onto the front stretch. And I just have to say, I've wanted NASCAR to do a street course, but this has been unbelievable. Whether you're a new fan of NASCAR or a longtime fan, there's no denying how how big this race has been for this sport. It's just unbelievable experience here on the ground and seeing these fans just take it all in. They're expecting over 70,000 fans to be able to experience racing this weekend. And so we've seen, you know, full suites and full grandstands. What I just haven't expected is the fans, how they've lined up along the fence, like on Lakeshore Drive, you know, things we've taken for granted, which is the speed of these race cars and the sound. Um, you see these newer fans. I mean, look at that right there. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, what are they, 10 deep or so? Maybe even more than that. Yeah, it's it's very amazing. Uh, this right here is turn two. You see that? That's actually the garage area back there in the distance where you see the haulers. But look at the backdrop. I mean, that's just something that NASCAR has never seen before. They've never experienced something like this. And there, again, are the fans, a lot of new, some old. Well, and I want to give the Chicago fans credit, right? Like, I know Chicago is a sports town. We know it from all the sports teams, and they're diehard. But a new sport, how diehard would they be? Very, because it was a wet morning. You see all the ponchos. They've still come out in droves. This is a great shot, as you see. Congress Loop uh, and the fans, they're appreciative of the show we're seeing from NASCAR. And green flag is back out. Bell back into the gas. Larson right on his back bumper. We'll see if he has anything for him in one. Here they come now up the front straightaway into turn number one. Christopher Bell, Kyle Larson. Larson practically pushing him through one. And Daniel Suarez, he'll glance off the barrier in one. They sort it out. Battle for the lead in the right-hander. Turn two to Lakeshore Drive. Down the long straightaway here. Larson losing a little bit of ground. Big battle right here as everybody's trying to recover around Suarez. We'll see if Suarez's car has any damage, if he's able to continue. He's been a tow link. Ty Gibbs having an incredible run today in this race in that 54 Interstate Battery Toyota. Truex still out of control. This is probably one of the most aggressive parts of this race we've seen all afternoon. They work their way down the straightaway into turn number six. Good battle for the lead now as Alex Bowman has found a problem onto the racetrack and he has come to a halt on the racetrack. That is the straightaway leaving turn five, headed to turn six. The leaders, meanwhile, headed to turn nine. Great battle for the lead right here. The aggressiveness has picked up. The laps are winding down. Two to go before the stage ends. Kyle Larson had the fastest car before that last caution. 
He is putting a ton of pressure on Bell. Bell's able to exit the corners very well. Larson struggles a little bit, but beats him under braking. Paved ovals, dirt ovals, road course. It doesn't matter. NASCAR to sprint cars. Christopher Bell and Kyle Larson continue to battle. What are you hearing on the 48, Marty? No oil pressure, Steve, and finally the engine let go. That is two drivers right at the playoff cut line with the 48 and Alex Bowman and also the 23 of Bubba Wallace. And there you see the smoke coming out of both sides. And that'll bring the caution out because he's stopped, which with just one lap to go, this is going to end stage one. And so the field will be frozen when the caution comes out. That means that Bell is going to win stage two as well. So we sweep stage one and stage two. They'll have to push Bowman back into the garage. And you heard Marty just say it, Alex Bowman. Um, remember, he had to sit out a couple races due to a, a broken back, of all things. He sustained in a race car accident, not in a NASCAR race, but in a sprint car race. He's come back in the point situation. He's yet to win, but he came in just barely outside the playoff picture. And now on the left side of your screen, all the way down at 20th at minus 32. Really the big gainer today for me is Daniel Suarez up there in 15th. Uh, Daniel currently running in the seventh position. Great work trying to inch his way up. Remember, if a new winner, somebody outside wins, that cut line kind of moves. So it's a moving target. And Bowman, one of the drivers who has missed because of injury. The other one, Chase Elliott, uh, could be in the same situation there. You saw the car missing the turn and just sliding up against the wall. Again, that's Daniel Suarez in the 99. Larson putting a lot of pressure right there on Bell. But yes, yeah, Suarez able to keep it going. Suarez fell back to seventh after that incident. Rick, you, you can feel like the intensity is picking up, yeah. right? Everybody talked to patience and, oh, we're going to get used to the track and all those talking points a couple days ago. Not anymore. It's not a new track anymore to these drivers. It's the same track they've been on for 44 laps. And they're pushing. And it's not dry, but it's getting drier, I would say, from 10 to 11. Well, fans, stick around as Lido's will take us from the asphalt of the Chicago Street Race to the surface of the moon. In today's news, President Kennedy in a speech at Rice University.
First two stages complete in the NASCAR Cup Series Chicago Street Race, the Grant Park 220 on NBC. And the most points earned today, Bell winning both stages. That's 10 points for winning the stage. And so he gets 20 points after winning both. You see that big smile? You know why that is, Rick? You had him in fantasy? Oh, I have Bell, Reddick, the 91, and the 5. So as long as they don't mess it up from here, I'm feeling pretty good about the day I've had so far. And, and I, I joke, but that's really the point, right? So when we say points earned today, they can't be taken away. They've earned them in the stages. So now if you have an issue like what Alex Bowman had, mm -hmm. you at least kind of have a little, bit of a, a, a little bit of a silver lining to your day. Dave? So, Steve, Michael McDowell runs in the top five. Note that this week the crews are servicing their cars in the opposite direction. Pit crews flow. Pit lane flows in the opposite direction. So Michael decided he would be the driver behind the wheel when the crew practiced this week. Usually it's not the high-priced driver. Usually it's just a crew member that does it. Michael got behind the wheel to make sure his guys were on point for the pit stops today. There should be one more, Kim. Well, Dave, for rookie Ty Gibbs, it has quietly been a fantastic day. Currently finds himself in the sixth position. And when I talked with the team this morning, they said this season is about racing smarter for Ty, trying to limit their mistakes and get as many points as possible, knowing they are within striking distance of finding a spot in the playoffs. Marty, no complaints really from Ty so far, just lacking a little bit of rear grip on that Toyota. Kim Martin Trex Jr. is in the eighth position right now. His crew chief, James Small, told him a moment ago, listen, if you just stay online, we'll be fine. At times, we've had some of the best cars, one of the best cars here today, and at times, we have struggled. You've seen him make contact with the wall. There is no damage from that contact. His biggest struggle is exit of right-hand corners. And James also told him a moment ago, Steve, hey, back it down a little bit. Back yourself off a little bit. There's plenty of pace there, but we need to survive. Well, I, the only thing that concerns me about you and I both we did the count yeah, yeah six exit of rights <laughs> a lot of rights a lot of rights yeah. James small right there now listen we talked a lot about the driver of the 91 and his supercar background well that's where this man right here came from James is is from Australia and he races a lot and grew up in that supercar kind of garage here just like we I grew up in NASCAR so he knows a lot about changing both directions knows a lot about street courses and obviously helping his driver, Martin Truex Jr., to a solid run, still running inside the top 10. I love these two get on the radio. Man, not my style, but they have a, a very interesting style. They will snap at each other. So I'm just hearing from NASCAR. They have made the decision that because of the late start and sunset, they have changed the length of this race, and they're letting all the teams know this race will end at lap 75. So you see that in the upper left corner of the screen. 47 of the 75 laps have been run. And so now the finish line has changed. They're going to 75 laps now. All the teams know it. Well, now everyone is inside their pit window. So remember a yellow go, Logano, Byron, Sindrick, Bush, Harvick all came to pit road. Almarola, they just hit the lottery because they don't have to come to pit road right now. They'll stay out because they can make it to lap 75. So they're instantly going to get track position gifted to them by the uh, adjustment of the race length. Now the rest of the field will all come to pit road. And if you're Bell, Larson, Reddick, you're a little frustrated. These guys have leapfrogged you, but you have got to have a clean stop here and at least be the best car or at least the first car on new tires off from pit road. So right here, hard right hand corner. We are going to see a jam pit road. Small pit boxes, Dave. Kyle Larson gives up second place now to come to pit road. He'll get four fresh Goodyear tires and Sunoco fuel in the opposite direction of normal. A tear off too, so that you can see, Marty. Tyler Reddick, you see him coming down pit road, going to get those four fresh Goodyear tires. What a gift, as you mentioned, Steve, for everyone that pitted a lap 42. But Adam Stevens did tell Christopher Bell, yes, they shortened the race, but there's only nine cars that pitted at lap 42, and you're better than every one of them. You can pass all of them when you get back out on the track. Well, what an interesting twist in this race, Steve. It is an interesting twist, but I like that pep talk. Right, listen. Let's not hang on the bad brakes. Let's just get back focused, do what we can do. You see Bell, Larson clean off pit road, Reddick, the 54 of Gibbs. Also saw McDowell coming off, holding his position in fifth. The restart when we return.
A few new names up front now as the pit stops have shaken things up and the end of this race at lap 75 will also make things interesting. Justin Haley will be up front. Austin Dillon and Chase Elliott, the top three. Logano, William Byron and Cindric, the top six. Back up through the gears they go. Back to racing. Haley, can he hold off Dillon? Dillon back there in second. Chase Elliott in third. And how hard do they go into turn one? Here they come into the corner. You got Justin Haley in the 31. There's Chase Elliott in the nine. Logano in the 22. Logano will slip. That'll cost him a spot. It'll cost him the fourth position now, as William Byron will make his presence known in the top five. He'll take that fourth position, headed to three. The driver that's dominated this race, Christopher Bell, all the way back in 12th position. He's gonna have a lot of work to do to try to drive his way toward the front of this pack. All these cars a lot slower than him. There's a couple though toward the front. Chase Elliott, William Byron, that I think will be hard to run down. Dropping further back in the field, you saw Corey LaJoy making some moves inside of the top 10. Meanwhile, the leaders, here they come into turn number six. Joey Logano in the 22, Austin Cindric in the two. Their teammates as they all head to seven. Yeah, turn seven teammates, Fallon. Steve mentioned that these guys had a great strategy call. Hit it before that lap, before the last caution. Now they got track position. They most likely can make it the entire way. Great work by that team. But Justin Haley, leading the pack, grew up two hours from here. He is a good road racer. He will not be an easy pass. Byron in the wall. Byron missed the corner. Harvick around. They're going to stack up. It's too narrow. There's nowhere for everybody to go. You got to go right. They are all but stopped. There are seven cars sitting here with nowhere to go. They're trying to back up. It is a traffic jam. It's There's a traffic jam. There's nowhere to go right here. Traffic Mark. jam on Jackson Street, or Jackson Drive. And so they knew this was going to happen. You hear the fans yelling. But that was just a situation where one car got sideways, and then another one was so close he couldn't get by. But that means another caution lap and another restart, Steve. Well, first of all, the running order is going to be very interesting to see, but it, uh, Jeff, did it all start with the 24? It seemed like he got into the barrier first. Yes, that's right. The 24 of William Byron, who was in position to possibly win this race, he ended up getting into the barrier. Let's go back and watch. So here, there it is right there. William just missed the corner. Again, these wet conditions got out of the groove, and then it just snowballed from there. If you were able to get in this right lane and get by this, that was a lucky break. Here it is right here. See, William just missed the corner. Just pushing hard. Wet conditions out of the groove, and Harvick spun around in front of him, and that's what started this long jam. Did we see Corey LaJoy get into the back of the four there also to maybe help him get around? We did. Yeah, we did. But, I, I mean, listen, I don't know. what. There it is right there. But I think what happened was the four of Harvick saw the 24, and he probably checked up trying to avoid him, and Corey didn't see him. It's very narrow. It's hard to see through these cars. See right there? I just think that that was, I don't think Corey did that on purpose or it was anything terrible there. It's just Harvick was probably trying to get slowed up. Well, look who's stuck right in the middle of it. 37 laps led today for Christopher Bell, and you see the 20 stuck right in the middle of the traffic jam. It's like rush hour in Chicago, nowhere to go. I agree. So you see right here, you just wonder what Jeff was saying. So, so Kevin Harvick had a little gap in front of him, so I think he probably adjusted his speed. And we've seen Corey LaJoy be very aggressive into this corner. I think he get, just gets into the back of him. But look at this lucky break slash great driving. I'm going to give him a little bit of both for Tyler Reddick. Also, Daniel Suarez. Watch this right here. Oh, oh McDowell the, couldn't, but yeah, Reddick, Reddick gets through. Yeah, a little Suarez contact also. with the 20. Suarez, Reddick both through. And for that reason, it's still Haley and Dylan and Elliott up front, but then a different group of cars behind them. Remember, we talk about the jumbling of the field and the 20 kind of had track position after it went up, took the lead all day long, and now he's going to be sitting way back here. And now NASCAR has to decide how this scoring is going to work. It's going to be very difficult to kind of untangle this. Yeah, this happened. You know, it's a road course, and we have spotters all over. You know, we probably have two spotters, most teams do. But right here on Michigan Avenue, the spotters are all, it's right on top of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra building which is only a half a block away. So they were able to see it, but there was really not much you could do. Once it got blocked up, there wasn't anything, but it happened right in front of the spotters.
you're going to see a lot of cars jockeying for position in the lineup because NASCAR is going to have to make a big decision. OK, were you able to continue? Where do you fall in line? Yeah, so basically it goes back to the last loop line unless you were in the wreck, which is basically three quarters of the field. Right. So now we're going to have to kind of peel it back piece by piece. NASCAR is going to have to work the lineup out. NASCAR will put them back in line and we will have another restart from here in Chicago. These breathtaking aerial views have been brought to you by Pods. Moving this summer, save up to 30% at Pods.com today. Want to see which drivers are on the move? Brought to you by Elk Grove Village. Plus 36 spots for Haley. Yes, Haley is up front for the restart. And then, actually, there's only about four or five that are certain of their positions. And after that, there's a lot of confusion as to where they're going to line up. Dave? Not bad for Justin Haley up all those positions, and its uh, strategy is leading to that. I just talked to Trent Owens, his crew chief, about their fuel situation, and that was under green. Under green, they would need three laps. They were three laps short on fuel. Under caution, if they can get about six laps, it's two to one usually the way you calculate, they could make it. They're counting them off here, and Kim, that may not be the last caution today. That's right, Dave. For Austin Allen, he qualified 29th. And when I talked to crew chief Keith Rodden this morning, their whole goal today was to get off strategy and see if they can do something with this race that way. That is exactly what has played into their hand. They last stopped on 31, just like Justin Haley checked in with the team. They feel very confident about where their fuel window is, Marty, especially with these cautioned laps. Well, Kim, what a crazy weekend it has been for Chase Elliott. The wreck and qualifying, going to the backup car, starting at the back of the field, coming up through the field. Then the spin in this race, they fix the damage from that. And Alan Gustafson tells him this gets us closer. I think they would feel more comfortable if they
they got another caution here for Chase Elliott in the 19 to make sure they could make it all the way. But boy, what a game changer, Steve. And no team maybe needs this win more than Chase Elliott and his group. Remember, missed the seven races earlier this year. Right now, not in the playoffs for that group. And Tyler Reddick, real quick, was in the middle of that contact. Jeff called that, and they have a little bit of damage. The toe is knocked out on the 45, but according to Tyler, not bad enough to pit. Yeah, and pit road was open, so anybody that would have come would have already had that opportunity. You see the cars swerving back and forth, just trying to keep the tires clean. They pick up all the loose marbles and they stick to it. Um, and then the, the cars have very little traction, so try to clean up the tires when they can. We've got the scoring all worked out, so a big break for Reddick. Gibbs, Almirola kind of moved themselves up. Bell and Larson lost of track position. We saw Harvick sideways, and you see what it would look like right there. Yeah, as they run. Yeah, 11 cars in yellow. Haley is leading, though. That would move him above. We talk about, you know, what it would mean for Chase Elliott. Well, you know, Haley would move into the playoffs. Austin Dillon, who's running second, he would jump above. He's not even in the top 20 of points. We have Chase Elliott. So a lot of names at the front of this field that could change the playoff picture. A win, and you advance into the playoffs, which will begin in eight races. Cleaning the tires off as they come through the Xfinity 10G turn. And those folks enjoying themselves there along Michigan Avenue. Getting ready for the green flag as they get over Jackson Drive and into the restart zone. It is Haley, Dillon, Elliott. Hard onto the gas and onto the front stretch once again. Haley pulling away after a great restart. Three car lengths ahead of Dillon. Here they come into turn number one. Justin Haley away, but here comes Austin Dillon. He's going to send it in a little hard. Right now, he'll be one, maybe two car lengths behind. Very aggressive restart. Austin Dillon in the three, and there's Chase Elliott in the nine. Had trouble earlier today, has rebounded quite nicely. Now inside the top five. Justin Haley leads down the back straightaway, locks up the right front tire in the braking zone. Quick through turn four into turn five. Look at these cars sliding out to the brick concrete wall here. Almost hitting the wall there in turn four, exiting four, and a traffic jam through turn five. And now they will swing wide and set up for the entrance to turn six. That's the left-hander back onto Balbo. Single file as one car spins around. It's Martin Truex Jr. exiting turn number four, facing the wrong way. Basically facing southbound on the northbound lane. He'll right that car, spin that Toyota around, and then send it back up. Columbus Drive as we pick up the leaders in front of Jeff Burton. Look at this battle right here, Austin Cedric, trying to keep a hard charge in Ty Gibbs behind him. Ty Gibbs had a really good day. His very first Xfinity race was on a road course at Daytona, and he got the win. Look at the two car sliding around. Here's what happened to Truex. Around he goes in front of the field. Lucky that wasn't a bigger wreck. But we got Bubba Wallace off course over here in front of me. He's in the runoff area. He's trying to work himself back onto the racetrack. He's back on now. Yeah, Bubba Wallace now making his way up Jackson Drive and has lost quite a few positions. He tucks in behind Blaney as they make the right hand turn back onto the front stretch. Let's look again at what happened to the 23. Just got in there a little bit too deep. We see multiple people do that as the track is dried. The braking zone has gotten longer, but if you miss it, it's still wet over here. This is the wettest part of the racetrack. If you get offline, it's not going to slow down. We've seen other parts of the racetrack. We're actually seeing them lock the brake front brakes up. That's not going to happen over here. It's too wet. Leaders now clearing turn number six, watching everyone set up for this corner as they work their way through turn number six and headed back to Michigan Avenue. Daniel Suarez, that's the 99 car. He's got damage to the left front, making contact onto the racetrack, hoping that left front. Oh, and Noah Gregson sends it into six. Matter of fact, it got locked up, backs it in, spins the car around, tries to right the car. Several drivers coming to grief here in the last handful of laps. And Noah Gregson 
when he comes back to Chicago, he will never drive on Columbus Drive. This <laughs> might be the worst place for him to go. Uh, he's four times he has been into the turn six tire barriers. You see the damage right here. What happened? Contact between. I couldn't tell if it was the one. Yeah, the one. I think the one got into the 38. I mean, it's everywhere. Let's look on board with the one right here. I can see what Ross is thinking right too wide in front. The 38 has a pretty wide entry. Ross thinks he's going to get into the bottom contact of the 38. And then the 42. Mm. Just misjudges the best I could tell. Misjudges it. He loses control obviously, but speed seems to be much higher than the cars around him. Backs it into the tire barriers. And there you see the damage to the left side of the 99 for Daniel Suarez. Suarez trying to get by Hamlin. Right behind them, Eric Jones. Over the bridge and into turn seven. Coming towards you again, Jeff. You have to wonder how long NASCAR will let that 99 car ride around there with that piece of debris hanging off of it. See that dry section of the racetrack? Heading through the loop, now downhill. This heavy braking zone, we've seen so many people miss. Look how wet it is. They slide through 11, back up over the hill, and the right-hander back on the front stretch. It is Justin Haley. He has a good lead over Austin Dillon and Chase Elliott. You remember when you were a kid playing with Hot Wheels? Well, they just got a whole lot bigger. Buckle up for an exciting new competition. It's Hot Wheels Ultimate Challenge. 
Tuesdays on NBC and streaming on Peacock. 18 laps remaining from the street course here in Chicago. Justin Haley, after some pit strategy, has found himself out in front. Austin Dillon is a half a second behind. Chase Elliott, 1.4 seconds behind Haley. And then Reddick has been able to clear Kyle Busch. He's running fourth. Here's Christopher Bell getting into the tire barrier in turn one. Yeah, it looked like he just getting in too hot. And as the car's peeled off, he just just way too much speed. There's no other way to put it. You see the contact to the tire barrier is able to keep going. You see him. Treble turn embraced. six. Tyler Reddick is buried into, into the uh, tire wall. In turn number six, Tyler Reddick took a wider line coming in. And this portion of the track that he's stuck in is still wet. He's on slicks. He's trying to get traction. And he can't because the pavement's wet. He has buried that monster energy Toyota Camry into the safer barrier right here at the end of Columbus Drive. Caution comes out, and they will have to pull him out from underneath the tire barrier. Tyler Reddick had just made his way up to fourth. He had passed Kyle Busch, and now frustrated with himself. So while they pull him out of the tire barriers, we're going to reset once again and have another reset and restart from the streets of Chicago. Tough break there for Reddick. Full day here in Chicago as you look back there at the Fuel Museum and home of Sue, who's the largest T Rex that they have found. And we have had a, an enjoyable day calling this race radio style, and that means we go from broadcaster to broadcaster. We want to check out the guys that are up on their perches. And Bagman, you may have to call in sick to work tomorrow. <laughs> you have yelled trouble more than anybody of the broadcast team. 
news for you, Rick. I'm going to be hitting the old Loon's Golf Drops tonight to juice up for TMD tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. on Series XM NASCAR Radio. What I've seen here in Turn 6 today is a whole lot of contact into that safer barrier behind me. This is this is one of those corners that has really been the thorn in a lot of sides today, or in this case, the tire packs have been a thorn in the sides of those race cars. It's been a handful down here, but this race has been amazing to watch, and the fans have enjoyed it here at my end of the racetrack. Dale Jr., what about you? Yeah, down here in turn four, I think that, you know, this hasn't been much of a passing zone as we anticipated up until this last stage or these last few laps. We're starting to see some drivers like Tyler Reddick and like Ty Gibbs get more and more desperate. The faster cars that we saw earlier in the race kind of mired back in the backside of the top 10, pushing really hard. They're taking advantage of some opportunities here, sliding tires and all those, all those things getting into turn four. But heading out of turn five, down to turn six, uh, great long straightaway, another passes on down there near you uh, in turn six and then heading over to Jeff Burton. Yeah, you know, it's been fun for me to watch these drivers adapt as this racetrack has changed. No, you all knew coming here it was a tight racetrack and it was going to be a challenge. It was made even more difficult with the rain. And now the track drying, where can I push my limits, where is the speed? And after all of that, we have the top three cars. None of these three drivers have won a race this year and all three are way out of the points. Any one of these three guys wins, they're in the playoffs. And I think that going forward, there's so much on the line. They're going to have to be aggressive if they want to win this race. But we've seen what happens if you get too aggressive. Yeah, that's a great point to bring up too, Jeff. Let's bring in the Peacock Pit Box and DJ and Brad Doherty. Guys, do you think Haley can hold off the hard charging Dylan, Elliott and Bush? You know, Brad, this guy's the Justin Haley is a real talent behind yeah. the wheel, yes, he and is. he's getting more comfortable in these cars uh, each time that he drives. Uh, and he's got a tremendous amount of talent uh, on road course this uh, at a street race this time. Uh, I really believe that he has everything that it takes. If he's got enough fuel, they're going to have a hard time getting by. Him. Well, the thing that we've noticed is you just can't get outside of the dry line yeah. at all. There's no grip anywhere. But I'm watching that Chase Elliott. He's really <laughs> good at the end of these races, so it'll be interesting to see what happens. Yeah, a lot of them we thought uh, didn't know that we're going to be up here in this particular time yep. uh, but let's look back exactly what has happened and how we got here a little bit uh, we can see uh, kind of what towards the end this was Jensen Button trying to get onto pit lane but he was really wide there and Chris Busher got into him spun Joey Logano had to, to avoid that but we've seen a little bit of action everywhere yeah these guys down in turn six I mean uh, uh, poor old Noah Gregson just can't get away from that wall he's got he's been in there five times a day just kept getting into the wall. Yeah, Martin Truex has not found this to his liking either as things went on. Uh, he got into the wall there, and then, I mean, this is a really hard lick. I can't yeah. believe that it didn't do more damage there. Uh, we can see here, Denny Hamlin just got in way too hard and got into Alex Bowman. Yeah, both those guys got in there a little bit hot. He didn't mean to get into Alex, but there's nowhere to go. Yeah. And again, it's just, a matter, it's just a matter of staying inside that line, and then you see the fire there with Alex Bowman. And this is, we knew this was going to happen at some point in time, and it did, came right down in front of Jeff Burton. But this is the, became the parking lot that we expected might happen here uh, with something happening on the exit of one of these corners and uh, about 14 cars involved in all Yeah, of that was a bad one. And then here we go with Truex again. He gets spun around in the middle of the track, goes to the back of the field. Uh, just no luck there. And then we see Gillilan. He gets knocked around there. He gets spun. And then last but not least. Yeah. Noah, back in turn six once again. <laughs> Wendy's is going to have to Poor sponsor fella. that corner down there next year. Poor Poor fella. And then what about this uh, guy? They changed the race to 75 laps to go. Christopher Bell gets shuffled back. He's, he's got, he starts from 12. Now all of a sudden his race is over. And then here we go, Rick. Yeah, unfortunate. Uh, got locked underneath those tire bears, which we've seen uh, now three cars that have done that today with Kyle Busch, Noah Gregson, and most recently, Christopher Bell in the 20 as they come over the bridge into the restart zone and back into the gas they go. Haley has Dylan all over his back bumper. Dylan trying to get him a little bit loose as they came through 12. Now he's two car lengths back, but aggressively attacking after Haley. Battle for the lead, 15 laps to go. Austin Dillon now into three, looking to the inside momentarily. He couldn't get the move done in turn one. Now let's see how it shapes up in two. Haley in the 31, Dillon in the three, now under fire from Chase Elliott in the nine and others. Austin Dillon off, uh, ran offline just a little bit there in turn two. A lot of, a lot of lock up over the buffs. Dillon dives down into four there, trying to make up a little ground the breaking zone. 
Off turn number four, five, and now headed to six. We'll see how this shapes up now as everybody's driving deep into these corners. Here they come. Here come all the leaders now. Hard onto the brakes. Oh, Dylan nails Haley, pushing him through six, down to the inside. But Haley stayed the course and keeps the lead to seven. You can see what Austin Dillon is trying to do. He's trying to beat Haley under braking. Austin Dillon in that three car is putting a ton of pressure on him. Remember, this area that they are approaching, it is wet down here. Will Austin Dillon try to get to the right of him? No, Haley did a great job of going through the loop better. He has distance on him now. No way Dillon can make a move right here. Haley misses the groove, just a touch. Dillon gets a little bit of a run. Kyle Busch sliding sideways as he went through turn 11, but they are nose to tail. The top three with Haley in front of Austin Dillon. Here you see them coming out of the 10G turn, Xfinity 10G turn, and in through 11. And a little sliding there by the eight as they're still nose to tail. Off turn number one now, you got the leaders, Haley, Dillon, Elliott, Kyle Busch, Joey Logano. There are the top five. There's Logano back there in that yellow car. But how about a rebound for Kyle Busch? Dale found the tire barrier in front of me in six, and now he's running inside of the top five. It is real impressive to see the speed out of this car after that crash earlier in the race. Also, Austin Dillon never thought we'd be seeing him running in second place, putting pressure on Haley here late. He wants to get back to that back bumper, remind him he's there, make him pressure himself into a mistake. That's what he did the last time through turn six. Let's see if he turns the wick up again. Dylan's gonna come in hot again. He's gonna shut it down to about a half a car length. Not as hot as last time through, but Justin Haley doing a great job of keeping the lead here with 14 to go. He really is, and he's gonna have to do a good job. Austin Dillon has worked very hard at becoming a better road racer. He really struggled early in his career. He spent a lot of time in the off season doing some racing. Knew he had to get better. We run so many road races now, it's required to be good at it. Austin Dillon has put in a ton of work and maybe the most improved road racer on the circuit. Dillon, now a half a car length. We'll see how much pressure he puts on the back of Haley. Oh, he hit the wall. He hit the inside wall and sent him into the tire barriers. We'll see how much damage that has done. It's torn the left front off of Dillon's car. You see the tow link has been bent. Yeah, this is going to be the end of the day for the three car. There's no way he can continue with that much damage on the left front. It all started with contact on the inside of the corner, forcing the three straight. He was putting such pressure on the leader. In the end, a mistake for the three, Rick. Take another look at it. He bounces off that inside wall right into the tire barrier and hard contact with the left front. He was just pushing so hard, but right there he clips the wall and into the tire barrier. And Rick, he can't turn it into turn one. He just nosed it into the turn one barrier. The car won't turn, and now he's blocking turn one. He's trying to back it up. He's done it a couple of times. And as we see right there with that contact at the other end of the straightaway, now he's just trying to back it up on the pit road. And just trying to get out of harm's way. We stay green, under 13 laps to go, and he has made it onto pit road. He's backing up there. Now just a tenth of a second separating the top two. Chase Elliott now in a position where he could potentially win his way into the playoffs. Haley out front. Once again through turn 12. But now the closest car to him is Chase Elliott right there. Running in the second position. Bush has moved up to third. Logano, Ben Gisberton, is running in that fifth spot.
Things are heating up up front. Yes, SVG has closed the gap. He's up to third now in the fastest car on the racetrack. There have been issues in turn one, though. Yeah, you see the 19 takes the left-hander just too fast, goes by Balicki all the way up and catches the quarter panel of the four. And then joining them was the 21 of Harrison Burton. Just look at the speed in here. See the glowing rotors, too, and the 19. The front rotors were glowing orange. And then you see right there, brake lock up for the 21. The same thing into the tire pack. He was able to pull away, but you said it. Justin Haley leads Chase Elliott second, but Shane Van Gisbergen is flying a second a lap. Now over a second a lap, running the leaders down with 10 to go. Here he comes out of five. He's setting up for six, and he is outbreaking the front two. He is sending that car in about maybe 100 feet deeper than everyone else. He's cleared six. He's headed downhill to Michigan Avenue at seven. A great battle here for the lead. You got Haley, who's looking for his second cup win. Chase Elliott, defending champion. SVG has a ton of championships, three supercar championships. This is a great battle. Justin Haley's got his work cut out for him. He's a really good road racer, but he has two great ones behind him. And Dave, it looks like SVG is getting a little more aggressive. When he was asked after qualifying third for this race if he was feeling comfortable in this new to him race car, he said, absolutely not. I am still learning every lap. But the three time champion from New Zealand has been learning well. And all through the day, even though he got caught back in traffic, he has been going forward. He's got 16 lap better tires than the two cars in front of him. And he thinks he can get him before this is over. All of Australia and New Zealand, every motorsports fan over there at 11 a.m. right now are tuned in to see if Miss Bergen can make the passes needed to be able to get the lead of this race as we close in on the finish. Right there on the back bumper of Chase Elliott off of turn five, he's got a great run. Justin Haley, Chase Elliott running for their lives right now. They look in the rear view mirror and here's SVG looming larger. He's gonna ease it into the corner, gonna take a peek to the outside just for a moment. You're looking at SVG from Chase Elliott's car. Over the hill, downhill to seven, and right now he's looking for room to race. A great battle here. You can see the pressure being put on. A little bit of contact. 91 into the back of the nine on that previous corner. It's been since 1973, Mark Donahue won Riverside that a road course ringer came in and took the trophy from these guys. SVG's got a shot. Haley still out front. Chase Elliott right now almost blocking for Haley as SVG. That's Shane Van Gisbergen trying to get by the nine. He goes to the inside to take a peek. Not close enough, though, as they go into one. Here they come off the end of the front straightaway. He's looking for the right moment, maybe perhaps a slip from Chase Elliott. Chase Elliott con is conflicted right now. He's trying to go offense, but he's trying to play defense. He'll lose second as SVG is on the move. He'll take the spot. It's Bergen now in second place. Zeroes in on Haley out front. Haley looks in the mirror and sees a new car. Does that add pressure? Does that push the 31 into a mistake? Look at how much the 91 gains. He's right on the back bumper now out of turn five. Here he comes out of five. This is the potential change for the lead. Justin Haley in the 31. Shane Van Gisbergen now will take a peek. It's not there, but he gets right up on the back bumper of Haley. Battle for the lead and possibly the win. Leaving six and headed to turn seven. Oh, an aggressive move right here down the hill under breaking. We got a caution on the racetrack. We're gonna have to go back and see where they were lined up before that caution came up. Just as quickly as the pass was about to happen for the lead, Mark Truex Jr. of the 19 into the tire barriers hard. And so he's stuck in there with under eight laps to go. It's coming down to can SVG get by Haley and so strong. Well, and the 91's already left the 31 back in front. I think he knows that he hadn't completed the pass. We'll get that confirmed by NASCAR. Oh, yep, NASCAR's confirmed it. Justin Haley will get another shot, but this run by the 91, it's not just the pace of the car, but his nimbleness in traffic. I mean, that was closing in on two passes in the same lap. There you look back on Ben Gisbergen 
and he looks calm. Well, and it he, looks to me like he's just he's saying, OK, I've done everything I need to do. I'm now in contention to potentially win this race. Well, he's won 80 supercar races, so he knows how to win a three time champ. This is that garage 91 entry for track house. A third entry, Kimi Raikkonen has driven it. Let's see what happened to the 19. Oh, just, oh, look how bright red the rotors are. Breaking issue, loses control in turn one. picture in the NASCAR Cup Series is heating up. Everyone wants to win at their home track, right? I mean, that, that's like a dream come true. How about that, boys? Get right, baby! Woo! Yes! Atlanta! It's gone a complete 180 from what it used to be. It's a challenging race. It was chaotic and crazy. Woo! In prime time, again, Sunday night, NASCAR will take to what now is the high banks of Atlanta. <laughs> and can Chase Elliott do it again? Can he repeat? That's one of the great things about Atlanta. Uh, it will be the road to the playoffs, and it continues next week. Yeah, and, and it's it's maybe not as unpredictable of a street course as we have never seen, but the finishes at Atlanta continue to fill the highlight reel. Every time we think we know who has an advantage or who looks to be the best car, somebody else pops up. The Saba Lakeshore drive has been extremely fast all day. Bumpy as they were racing down into turn four from turn three, that kink in turn three. And it'll be a handful of laps that will remain. Justin Haley, does he have a chance to hold off? Shane Van Gisbergen. Justin Haley has one career win, and it came at really the biggest stage for NASCAR. It was at Daytona. There was a wreck. He was in front. 
when the caution happened. You see him in the 77. And so as everyone came to pit road, thinking that the possibility existed, they were going to restart. Lightning in the area, that severe weather caused him to call the race, and Haley was scored the winner. And so win number one. Now, could win number two be well earned if he's able to hold off the 91. Well, you heard DJ talk about it, and, and it's not just the Hall of Famer, Dale Jarrett, who have mentioned the talent that Justin Haley has. Now, I think of him instantly as the, like a super speedway racer. So maybe next week in Atlanta, um, just because he was so good at that discipline in the Xfinity series. But he's had some real highlights, you know, Second year now with Collig. There's Matt Collig right there. He owns Collig Racing. That has cars that race both on Saturday in the Xfinity Series and Sunday here in the Cup Series. But I will tell you, if you said, hey, a Collig car is leading here at a road course, I would have said A.J. Allmendinger. Yes. Not Justin Haley, but Haley has done a very nice job. Dave. So what a great opportunity for Shane Van Gisbergen and the 91 Project 91 car. It's his product of track house racing that's the team that entertainer pitbull and justin marks co-own this project was put together to get championship drivers from other areas to come in and race be a part of nascar i'm not sure anyone thought they could go to victory lane but shane van gisbergen certainly can because of his championship experience and now because of the experience he's had here today project 91 second place and going for one it'll be five laps to go haley Van Gisbergen right behind him. And we've seen what kind of pressure SVG has put on racers to make them make mistakes. Can Haley be mistake free for five more laps? Through the restart zone they go. Five to go here in Chicago. A car length, now two in front of the 91 is Haley. He's going to have to be perfect. Here he comes into turn number one. Haley so far so good. Slips just a tad off the quarter. But now here he comes. Battle for the lead. Shane Van Gisbergen to the inside. And to the lead off turn two with less than five to go here in Chicago. But Haley is right there. He's coming back to the inside through turn three. He's going to retake the lead. The 91 back to the inside into turn four. The crossover move. He is now clearing to the lead. Gisbergen off of turn five, down the long straightaway. He's got wide open racetrack to work with and no pressure from behind because he's going to pull away by one, maybe two car lengths. It's Van Gisbergen with the lead. They're stacked up from second on back as everybody jostles for real estate. Van Gisbergen to the lead here in Chicago. Van Gisbergen. Van Gisbergen. SVG holding on to that top spot as Haley now has fallen back eight tenths now nine tenths of a second. The 91 with a hard right turn through turn 11. Coming up on four laps to go. What an impressive performance we have seen out of the New Zealander. He comes off the end of the front straightaway, and he's slowly starting to check out. Justin's ha Justin Haley's opportunity is fading to try to win this race this afternoon, and here he comes. SVG out of two into the right-hander. Here he comes now, racing his way up Lake Shore Drive to three. Look at the replay of this battle. Up front, they head into turn two. Van Gisbergen goes to the inside here. He's passed this way before, knows how to make that happen, but Justin Haley, hey, I'm proud of him, man. He brought the fight back to the 91 here down this straightaway. Who turn three, offline the 91, does the crossover move into turn four. A great job out breaking, just too much speed, too much talent for that 31 and Justin Haley. Now Haley under attack from Chase Elliott and a lot of other cars back there. Van Gisbergen is just driving away. He had the fastest car by far. He was about a second a lap faster as he was running down the 31 of Haley and the nine of Elliott. And once he got clear, he is driving away. I do not expect a mistake from this guy. He is experienced. He's used to winning big races. This will be huge for his career if he can finish it off. But he has been in this moment before. 
so many big moments for drivers that have come into this series and their first start. You look back, 1949, of course, Jim Roper, Charlotte Speedway. It's back when NASCAR started. 49, 50, 50. So many early drivers in their first start, but that was back when NASCAR was young. Now, 75 years in, and Van Gisbergen could be added to that list as winning his first start in the Cup Series. Gisbergen in the 91 driving away. Haley keeping a comfortable distance between him and Chase Elliott off into turn four. Larson a little ways back from Chase Elliott. He has company from Kyle Busch, Austin Sendrick, McDowell, Legato, Gibbs, Alberoli, your top ten. Kyle Busch really hanging it out there, coming out of turn number five as they race their way into turn number six. That's the gap for the lead as they race their way into the corner. Everybody just trying to get to the finish unscathed as they leave six and go downhill to turn seven. It's 1.14 p.m. on Monday in New Zealand. Not far from being at a party. They're going to have a great time, a lot of national pride, watching this race car driver take the fight to NASCAR's best. He's been impressive all weekend, practice, qualifying, and now the race. He is cruising away from him. Yeah, and a very humble race car driver. We talked to him before the race. He was so humble saying, you know, I'm still learning. I'm still learning. Yeah, potential first win for the driver, but it would be the 24th win for the crew chief. Darian Grubb on the pit box. He has won with the likes of Jimmy Johnson, Tony Stewart, Denny Hamlin, Carl Edwards, Casey Mears, an amazing list of drivers for that crew chief now trying to take a first timer to victory lane. Think about the drivers that have came from that supercar V8 discipline. Marcus Ambrose has to be watching, smiling, thinking about his time in the NASCAR Cup level and the success he Turn had. Turn number one, Bubba Wallace into Ricky Stenhouse Jr. and into the tire pack Stenhouse goes. Bubba came in way too hot, flipped Stenhouse, and Stenhouse has buried that Chevy into the tire pack. That's off the end of the front straightaway. And it looks as though he's stuck. Sure enough, the caution comes out. And the driver did not get the white flag that's out front. That is the only way that the race could be over if a caution comes out with under one to go. But that means we'll go into overtime. So a little more racing for the fans here in Chicago and those of you watching. Look at this as Bubba in the 23 slid into the 47. The 47 gets locked underneath the tire barriers in turn one. Yeah, Bubba just completely out of line. Drivers left. I don't know if the track was still damp or if he was just out of control, but you see him coming in with a head of speed, already spinning out. Ricky Stenhouse probably has no idea what happened. KO'd from the side, and he ends up, here you go. Take a look right here from on board with Kevin Harvick. Big impact for the 47 and the 23.
setting here on Chinatown, the Windy City. And just a couple laps remain. It will be overtime for the NASCAR Cup Series in their first ever street course race. And we want to hear from the guys who have been calling it from the different turns around this track. Are, and are any of the three of you amazed at what we're seeing out of the New Zealander? I'll start with you, Mike. It is amazing what this driver has done. He's getting ready to make history as we've documented here a few moments ago, but it's been a long time since a road course ringer has gone to victory lane and especially in his first ever start in this series. It's been amazing to watch him do it so smooth, but yet all aggressive at the same time. Dale Jr., what about you? Yeah, the Giz, as he's known to all those fans in V8 Supercar, uh, has done an amazing job and I'm not surprised because as I was saying before the caution Marcus Ambrose came here adapted really quickly I think the V8 supercars are very very comparable to what we race here even now with this next gen car more closely resembling each other so no surprise to me V8 supercar is NASCAR to what NASCAR is in the US to, to Australian and New Zealand fans so uh, it's awesome to see, though, and uh, hopefully we have a spectacular finish, and that will be a popular win if he makes it happen, Burton. Yeah, I think one of the things that will be difficult for him is these, this late race restart. However, what he does have going for him is that Australian supercar is an aggressive series. They get after it. They race hard, and they are not open-wheel cars. They're, they're closed cars like these are with fenders. So. They know how to race. They know how to be rough when they need to be. So I don't think this moment is too big for him. However, there's some people behind him that are very, very hungry that a win could be career changing. What are people willing to do this late in the race? Yeah, that's correct. And they look similar to what we're seeing here. Obviously, uh, the wing on the back there. These are supercars, and this is what Shane Van Gisbergen has been able to be so successful in. Yeah, a few different aerodynamic changes. You mentioned the wing, but also they have the, the windows. He, he said earlier in pre-race that it's a little odd driving with open side windows. I've never thought of that before. I've never seen, you know, seen very many cars, Dave, with both windows closed on each side, but a very impressive run thus far. Well, remember, this is a left drive car. That is a right drive car, so this is brand new to him, too. And Jeff Burton nailed it. Think of the drivers behind him who want to win. They talked to Shane about it on the radio. The two cars behind you are desperate for a win for point situation for the playoffs. So just be prepared for that. Been doing awesome. Coffee, is it the 31 then the 9 again? Correct. And then they talked to him about an issue he thought he had when the caution came out. He thought he had a motor problem. He reported data back to the team as he could. A lot of things went through Shane's mind then, and the crew chief told him, Darian Grubb said, don't get paranoid. Your car is fine. Steve, these drivers have heard things uh, clicking in their cars or clanking in their cars when they're on the way to victory. Shane's trying to get that out of his head and hold off the guys behind well, him. Well, the man has won 80 supercar races, three championships, so he is a closer without a doubt. Uh, left drive and right drive, real simple. Where do you sit? Anybody that's ever been to England, they sit on the wrong side of the car. That's what we say. Well, you know, so think about that. He's shifting with his right hand in that supercar, shifting with his left. So, I mean, it's not a small change for him, but he has really adapted and adapted quickly. Now he has to adapt to NASCAR overtime. One good thing in his corner, the single file restarts that we've seen all day will make it a whole lot easier than if it was double file. Um, but there's still 12 very tricky corners in front of him and a bunch of hungry drivers behind him. Yeah, you mentioned uh, the restart rules and the overtime. And Steve, the other question is Haley and Elliott, do they have enough fuel? Well, that's going to be very close, right? Because these laps, once we go into overtime, you know, they don't really count towards the distance of the race. So Haley and Elliott, 45 laps on the tank. Now, a bunch of that is yellow, uh, but still, do you get a little stumble? Does it not pick up? That could be an advantage for the 91. It could be a detriment to someone like Larson, right? Does he hit them in the back or does he get by? We've seen some good lap times out of Larson. You wonder if he could clear them quickly. Could he challenge? All right, DJ, Brad, do you guys think the 91 rises to the occasion. Uh, this is phenomenal. I mean, you, you guys have documented what you've seen. We haven't seen this before. Uh, somebody come in and be as aggressive and as dominant as what he has been coming up through the pack. That was so impressive getting to the front. Yeah, no, no doubt about it. And I had the good fortune of having a, a V8 supercar driver in my yeah. car in Marcus Ambrose and won some Xfinity races for my race team. So I know how talented these young men are. So we're going to watch a great one here, Rick. And when the restart happens, overtime rules are they will go two laps. If they get back to the white flag without a caution, 
then the next flag that flies would end the race and they will go to video to determine who is in front uh, if that comes into question and you see the city street lights they are on and the field making their way down Michigan and now to Jackson Drive into the restart zone SVG trying to make history here in Chicago it's overtime presented by Credit One Bank down into turn one they go here they come with less than two laps to go SVG away with a lead by a car length maybe two you got Haley you got Elliott and now Kyle Larson's in the mix they're all stacked up right behind him but in command and pulling away is Shane Van Gisbergen to turn three and the battle now is for third fourth fifth you see those cars close together down into turn four no lockups everybody getting through here really cleanly in this coming to the white flag the 91 easily out front of the field this has been one of the smoothest parts of the racetrack when he leaves turn five and comes down columbus drive and sets up for the left hander into turn six he drives it in deep but he's very smooth he'll clip that inside swing it wide and head downhill to michigan avenue Steve mentioned it, the advantage of having a single file restart and allowed a very calm restart. SVG got a great restart, drove away from Haley, and now he just has to focus out front. He's driven far enough away where Haley cannot outbreak him. It is now mistake free time. Do not get yourself in trouble. Do not overdrive. Just keep pace with the car behind you. And he hasn't pulled away from Haley yet. Five back, all clear. Five back, you just heard that from the spotter. Van Gisbergen, out of turn 12, coming up to see the white flag. One more time around this street course in Chicago. Here they come into turn number one. Does Justin Haley or Chase Elliott, number one, have enough fuel in the tank? And do they have enough to get to the back bumper of that 91 car? Here he is, right-hander, turn two for the final time. You see the gap right there, pulling away down the back straightaway, cleanly through turn three. Full throttle into the braking zone, over the hump, a lock up by the 31 back there. Gets Bergen through four, through five. Smoothly onto the throttle, good corner exit. Headed back to you. He will swing wide out of five. He'll set up and go right to the middle of the racetrack and go drivers right now. Hard braking, down shifting. He's gonna drive it in way deep. and He'll pull away from Haley even more. He'll leave turn six downhill to Michigan Avenue for the final time this evening in Chicago. Track house racing drivers have been part of huge and great memories from Chastain to Martinsville to this. It's not over yet, but it's really close. The 75th anniversary of NASCAR, and it has been 60 years since a driver has won in their series debut. Well, through turn 11, Shane Van Gisbergen has been perfect. He has navigated the streets of Chicago to perfection. The final time onto the front stretch. He comes to the checkered flag. He's won the very first street race in NASCAR. back wins for track house racing a victory lap now for the 91 and the fans showing their appreciation all the way around this course a three-time champion of the supercars the checkered flag moment brought to you by advance auto parts Four-year-old from New Zealand. We mentioned earlier if he could add his name to the list, well, he has done it. 
60 years since Johnny Rutherford did it at Daytona back in 1963. He wins in his first career Cup Series start. Only seven drivers in the history, in the 75 year history of the sport, have been able to do it. And we saw it here, and it just shows the talent of his discipline that he is able to wheel a car around a street course. And he just did it with absolute precision and raw speed. As you see Daniel Suarez coming up to congratulate his fellow track house driver. How will he celebrate? That's the question. You know, we see burnouts, we see you know, so many different things. Last week it was throwing a watermelon onto I'm the racetrack. I'm confident to say we're not going to see a watermelon. We're not going to see a watermelon. That I'm willing to, to, to rule out, but so impressive. And it just shows you where NASCAR is in global motorsports, right? What a great. Here's your answer, Rick. show of power. to America, Shane Van Gisbergen. What a run for this young man. I was talking with his good buddy, fellow Kiwi and IndyCar driver, Scott McLaughlin. He said he's one of the smartest race car drivers I've ever had to compete against. And I think he's ready for a little celebration. Let's be honest, Shane. When this deal came together, did you honestly feel like this was possible? No, of course not, but you always dream of it. And thank you so much to the Trackhouse team and Hans Health, Project 91. Man, what an experience in the crowd out here. Like, this was so cool, and it's, it's what you dream of. So hopefully I can come and do more. What were you telling yourself on those final few restarts? Well, when we had that bad um, strategy back to 18th, I started to worry a bit, but had some full sends on some people, and everyone was, the racing was really good. Everyone was respectful, and. It was tough, but a lot of fun. It's Monday back in Auckland, but I'm sure there's a party going on at about one o'clock in the afternoon. What would your message be to all those young drivers back there in Australia and New Zealand? Oh, anything is possible, but you know, the, the fans in Australia and New Zealand, the response this week and the coverage has been, uh, I, I can't explain it, like the response and the support I've got from everyone and even over here, how welcoming everyone is. I, I can't believe it. Dream come true. So you know everybody's going to want you to drive their car now. Are you up for a full-time cup ride if you want? I'm doing one more year in Oz, and then uh, I'd love to come over here. There you go, one more year in Australia, and then he might come cup racing with us, Rick. Look at this crowd here on the front stretch in Chicago, and the fans in the stands as well. SVG gets the win. The Kiwi is a cup winner. And a popular one at that, as Shane Van Gisbergen will be heading to Ruoff Victory Lane. Once he got out front, it was dominant. No mistakes made. And you see how he celebrates Ross Chastain, his teammate for a day, cheering him on. Much more to come from the streets of Chicago. Stay with us.
Reminder, our post-race coverage continuing on Peacock, where each week we'll bring you the NASCAR America post-race show presented by Progressive. Steve, you mentioned some of the more beautiful sights here in the city of Chicago, the Chicago River, Lake Michigan, Grant Park, but probably the best sight for the New Zealander has to be the celebration right at the finish line and seeing the checkered flag in his first ever Cup Series start. Yeah, his performance really from the drop of the green flag in practice. He continued to jump to the top of the time charts as everybody got more and more comfortable. And but pre-race, he told us, nah, that was just my comfort with the streets. Everyone else will close in on me. Well, I appreciate the humility. But in the end, it was just raw speed and that experience and talent in street racing that paid the difference. I mean, he, you heard him all the way back to 18th. He moved his way for, on a track where we thought passing was difficult. He went from 18th to first over those closing laps. And here it comes from social media, <laughs> IndyCar driver. Yeah, Scott McLaughlin. Yes. He's a very happy. I'm going to paraphrase. Yes. Enjoy every moment, brother. New Zealand represent emotional. And we had heard from Dale Jr. He's got friends uh, in Australia and New Zealand. And, you know, at the very beginning of this race, they were just so proud of what SVG has been able to do and what he's shown America uh, just even in practice and qualifying. And then what he's able to accomplish here by winning this race. Winning it. And think of the position he was in. Obviously faster and never even touched the first two cars on his way by, right? Did it with such respect. With everything on the line, he raced. There's Darian Grubb, the crew chief, joining him right here. You know, he raced everybody with, with so much respect, understanding that it was kind of the, the new guy on the scene. But even that wasn't going to slow this 91 down. Dave Burns, Justin Haley, really shouldn't have anything to hang his hat about. He had an exceptional performance here in this street course race and winded up second. Justin Haley had the unenviable task of trying to hold off a three-time Supercars champion with 16 lap less fresh tires. Uh, talk us through the final laps there. Yeah, I mean, it was tough. I, I uh, put it in the tire barrier yesterday, and we stayed up all night. I stayed with the guys through the rain and uh, rewrapped this thing, put a new body on it, and um, Benish came on for this, for this weekend. Obviously, congrats to Project 91. It, it sucks, obviously. Um, you know where we are right now we don't have a, a we are in position to win every week so um coming that close obviously is uh not what you want but uh, just really proud of everyone at college racing and um what an awesome event can't uh, can't wait to come back next year once uh, your crew chief trent told you you were okay on fuel what clicked in your head then to just try and go get it because you had no idea where van giesbergen was yeah i mean i was really struggling on the under the braking zones um felt like i could get off the corner better than anyone but um I mean, what are you going to do? He had 16 lap pressure tires, um, just strategy. And uh, I feel like I put us behind yesterday, putting it in the tire barrier. And then uh, from there, it just kind of trickles and and uh, whatnot. But I mean, what is there to be disappointed about, you know? So we'll, uh, we'll go to Atlanta next week, try our best. Appreciate Cog Racing, Matt Colley, Chris Rice for giving me this opportunity and uh, trying to make the best of it. And Justin Haley showed what a good street racer he really is today. <laughs> They're still trying to get the car restarted. Maybe burned it down a little too much there on that uh, celebration. It's done its job at this point. Well, progressive NASCAR America post race show coverage continuing on Peacock. Let's bring in our guys that were up on their perches throughout this entire race and give us an overall view of the street race in Chicago. Rick, it was amazing. Wow, unbelievable. Earlier today, we didn't know if we were going to get going today, but I would say this is a big success. Pete Pistone and I are going to have a lot to talk about on Sirius XM NASCAR Radio tomorrow morning. Thumbs up. This was this was spectacular and something to remember for a long, long time. Dale Jr., what about you? I wonder how Gisbergen will rank this in his own career. Three Bathurst, Bathurst 1,000 wins among his many supercar wins. Just a dream night, a uh, dream evening for him, as he said. And what will Justin Marks do next with this 91? We've got some more road course races coming up. Who else might we see in this car with the potential to come in here and shock the sport? You know, Justin Marks has been willing to shake up the sport, do things differently, and he's had success doing it. And I got to tell you something. The industry, NASCAR, Chicago, the teams, everybody involved having the courage to do something different 
come to the streets of Chicago. Whoever questions that race, that was a good race. It was fun. It was a great time. Congratulations to everybody, because that was a fun few days here in Chicago. And, and I want to mention Julie Giese's name. Uh, she is the president of this street course race for NASCAR to come in here and do what they've been able to do. Uh, I'll echo the, the sentiments that we just heard. Uh, a resounding yes this was a huge success and thank you to the Chicago fans because there were a lot of reasons weather wise why today wouldn't be the day that you would come to Grant Park and see your first ever NASCAR race but they did they filled the place top to bottom every straightaway every fence line and that is what really set the stage for this amazing performance by this driver not only the straightaways and the trees the light poles <laughs> but also in the buildings surrounding the whole course you had people on the roofs you had people looking through the windows they were able to get through the torrential rain that took place the record setting rain from this morning and then the racing just continued to get better lap after lap after lap although some had troubles getting through those tire barriers in the end it was Shane Van Gisbergen who gets the checkered flag. Post-race coverage will continue on Peacock coming up next on NBC. It's America's Got Talent. telecast may not be reproduced, retransmitted, or used in any form without the authorized written consent of NASCAR Broadcasting. NASCAR would like to thank all of our fans for your support, and we hope you enjoy today's broadcast.